I grew up in the kind of Rust Belt town where the cleanest, safest place for kids to play was the local sewer canal. My friends Brett, Holly, Eli, and I met there almost every day during summer vacation. The overhanging trees gave us shade and hid us away from the adults. It was like our own a secret hideout. The only problem was the concrete tunnel at the end of it. Something about that tunnel, it made me think of a round, toothless stone mouth. Freakish, the oversized insects that we had never seen before buzzed in the humid breeze that blew out of the darkness. And it wasn't long before we started daring each other to crawl inside. Eli was the first to stick his head in, but he didn't dare to go any further. Holly, though, did. She snorted, called all of us scaredy cats, and crawled into the tunnel until only her tiny white shoe still hung outside of it. And then she screamed, the kind of hundred decibel shriek that only preteen girls were capable of. We grabbed her leg and yanked her out. She wouldn't stop scratching at her head. According to Holly, a spider as big as her own hand had just scurried through her hair. We avoided that tunnel for a long time after that. Well, until the day that I lost Eli's basketball. Now, it wasn't technically Eli's. It belonged to his older brother, Dwayne, a muscly 13-year-old that we all lived in terror of. In fact, the ball was Dwayne's most prized possession. Eli had only taken it to brag about the famous signatures that covered it. But like the dumb kids that we were, we couldn't resist throwing it around. I faked a pass to Brett, but I tossed it to Eli instead. And I didn't realize that he was standing right in front of the tunnel. Dwayne's prized ball slipped right through Eli's fingers and it disappeared into the darkness. One look at Eli's terrified face was all that I needed to imagine the beating that Dwayne would give us. Nobody was saying it, but we all knew what I had to do. I took a deep breath, got down on my hands and knees, and I crawled into the tunnel. The legs of a flying insect brushed against my ear, trying to climb inside. I cried out and smacked the side of my head, and I nearly slipped in the slime beneath my legs. Something more than the bugs and muck was bothering me. The tunnel was flat. How could the ball have rolled so far? Unless something had carried it. My friends were all cheering me on but their voices sounded so very far away. I shuddered and kept moving. After what felt like forever, I saw a light up ahead. It streamed down through a grate overhead into a small concrete chamber. Dwayne's basketball rolled right through it and into the gloom beyond. I had just stepped into the light when I had heard it. Bounce bounds. Looking for this, a voice asked from the shadows. Every instinct told me to scream and run, but I didn't. Who, who's there? I said. Do you want your ball back? The voice teased. Or not? I couldn't tell if the speaker was male or female, old or young. The darkness hid them completely. Of course I do, I huffed. Well, then how about a trade? You'll get what you want and I get something of yours. Like what? I could hear the ball bouncing again. I'll tell you when the time is right. Not now. It was only a basketball, I told myself. How big of a trade could it be? Okay, fine, 
give me the ball. And just like that, my trade came bouncing out of the shadows. It's been a pleasure. If you would ever like to trade for anything else, you know where to find me. I gulped and backed away, my throat dry. I didn't want to turn my back to whatever was lurking in the shadows, but I didn't have a choice. I looked up as I turned around. Two backlit, child-sized figures were staring down into the grate. I scrambled out of the horrible tunnel as quickly as I could. You found it! Eli's cheer died in his throat when he saw my face. What's wrong? I opened my mouth, ready to tell him everything. Nothing, I found myself saying. Where is Brett and Holly? They climbed up on top of the grate to spy on you, Eli frowned. Hey, are you sure you're okay? Yeah, never better. I forced myself to smile, wondering why I couldn't bring myself to talk about what I had found. How about a trade? You get something of mine and I get something of yours. Laying in bed that night, I turned those words over and over in my head as I listened to the windstorm outside. What kind of deal had I just made? When would the thing from the sewer be coming to collect? Branches scraped against the house like sharpened claws, and it was a long time before I was able to fall asleep. I woke to golden sunlight streaming through my bedroom window. I could hear my family arguing and laughing in the kitchen. The warm buttery smell of my father's pancakes drifted up the stairs. Maybe things will be okay after all. Or so I thought. But something had changed between my friends and I. When we met back at the sewer the next day, Brett and Holly, they, they seemed tense, anxious even. Like they were waiting for Eli and I to both leave. We parted ways after barely an hour had passed. The whole experience left me with a sick sense of foreboding, although I wasn't really sure why. The next day, we met again. I understood. Brett was hunched over and concentrating, driving a brand new remote control truck. It was a toy that his family could have never afforded. Yet here it was, zooming up and down the slopes of the canal. Holly watched, stuffing her fist into a bag of enormous Mars bars, the kind that were only available around Halloween time. Her parents had put her on a strict diet, or so I had thought. So where did the candy bars come from? I looked nervously at the black tunnel ahead. Hey guys, I smiled nervously. Where did you get that stuff? Nowhere. Brett and Holly responded in unison. Their flat tone reminded me of my own voice when I had tried to describe the bargain that I had made. As it turned out, the remote controlled truck and the bag of candy were only the beginning. Each time that Eli and I came down to the sewer canal, Red and Holly had more stuff. First, a Barbie mansion, then the board game Candyland, even light-up sneakers. It was so unnerving that Eli and I stopped going down to play by the sewer canal. We were afraid of what we might find. Soon enough, we weren't the only ones. There was something ominous about the way that the phone rang that night and the fear in my mother's eyes when she had handed it to me. It's your friend, Holly, my mother whispered. She sounds upset. I think her cat's missing. Have you seen it? 
I could barely hear my mother's whispers over Holly's sobs. Ariel's gone and she's never coming back. My friend was wailing. She had named her cat after the Little Mermaid because she loved water. The name usually made me laugh, but not that night. I can help you look for her, I stammered. No, you can't, Holly moaned. I found her collar by the sewer. She's gone. Another wail. My mother took away the phone and I was left full of doubts. What had Ariel been doing down there? The next day, Holly walked sheepishly over to the abandoned lot where Eli and I were kicking a soccer ball into a trash can. Can I play with you guys? What's wrong? Eli sneered, all out of other toys. The can boomed as he scored a goal. I'm not going down there anymore, Holly muttered. First, it was just my stuff that went missing, like my swimsuit and my house keys. But now that Ariel's gone, Holly couldn't say it, but I knew what she meant. She was scared of what might disappear next. For a long time, however, it seemed like nothing did. Brad, Holly, Eli, and I all grew up. I forgot about the dark sewer canals and the abandoned lots, and instead spent more and more time inside on my computer. Eli went from a scrawny, scared kid to the star of our high school soccer team. Holly grew into a clever and beautiful bookworm. Writing fantasy stories and fan fiction was her way of dealing with the terrible secret that we shared. Brett never left that secret behind. Out of the four of us, he was the only one who continued to visit the sewer canal on a regular basis. As a result, he seemed to get everything that he wanted. But he lost his friends. By our freshman year, Brett was looking at Holly in a strange and new way. It had been years since we had last spoken, but he finally built up the courage to cross the lunchroom and talk to her. Um, Holly, he stammered. I know we haven't hung out in a while, but I, I really like you, and I thought that maybe... Brett trailed off. A hush fell over our table as we stared at the floor, our lunch trays anywhere but at our old friend. I don't think it would work out, Brett. Holly finally answered. I'm sorry. Brett turned to crimson, clenched his hands into fists and stormed off. After school, I knew exactly where he was going. By the time that I caught up with Brett, he had already reached the sewer canal. Brett, I know you think this will fix things, but you've got to listen to me. It won't. My old friend looked over his shoulder at me, shook his head, and then crawled inside. I stepped forward to follow him, but the moment that I looked into that tunnel, I was nine years old again, swatting away freakish bugs, dragging my knees through the slime, listening to that horrible voice, the bouncing of the basketball too. No, I couldn't force myself to go in there a second time. And by the time that Brett crawled back out, it would be too late. I stuffed my hands into my pockets and trudged home in the autumn twilight, feeling much older than I ever had before. I woke to a dark room and the echo of a ringing phone. I looked at the clock. 4.04 a.m. Full of foreboding, I sprinted to the kitchen and answered it before any of my family could wake up. Oh God. Brett whispered. This wasn't what I wanted. You've got to believe me, it wasn't me. The boom of a door flying open. A scream. The line went dead. I knew what had happened long before the trial, the news coverage, or the assembly the principal held about. The terrible tragedy in our midst. And when Brett claimed that he hadn't been the one who slit Holly's throat and placed her body in his bed that night... I was the only one who believed him. Years had passed since I chased Eli's basketball down that dark tunnel. 
but I still hear its bounce in my dreams. I try to tell myself that the voice in the sewers has already taken what it wanted from me, or that it might even have forgotten about me, but I know that I'm wrong. How will I know when I've made my trade? When I try to stop my car and find that the brake lines are missing, when I check my two-year-old son's crib and find it empty, or will it be when I wake up back in that lightless concrete tube, naked and helpless, with that horrible voice whispering in my ear, Now I've got something of yours, something I've been wanting for a long time. Are you tired of the stress of meal planning and grocery shopping? Say goodbye to the hassle and say hello to HelloFresh. With HelloFresh, you'll receive a weekly delivery of fresh, high-quality ingredients and easy-to-follow recipes that are perfectly portioned for your household. Our meals are designed by professional chefs and tested by real families, ensuring that you'll always get delicious, satisfying dishes that everyone will love. And with a variety of options including vegetarian, low-calorie, and family-friendly meals, there's something for everyone at the dinner table. No more arguing over what to make or settling for the same old recipes week after week. With HelloFresh, you'll enjoy fresh, flavorful meals without any of the stress or waste. The ingredients are delivered in eco-friendly packaging, and the recipes are designed to minimize food waste and make the most of every ingredient. And to get started, go to HelloFresh.com slash MrCreep16. Use code MrCreep16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. Again, that's HelloFresh.com slash MrCreep16 and use code MrCreep16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. 911, what is your emergency? I said, answering on the first ring. It had been a slow day up to that point, but that was all about to change in a moment. I just saw something bad. A hysterical voice cried out on the other end of the line. My neighbor, she's outside, and she's bleeding. Bleeding from where? I said. Everywhere, she screamed. I tried to get her address, but she was so hysterical that she kept yelling for help. Eventually, she calmed down enough to give me her street. I heard new voices in the background, all shrieking. We have a unit on the way, I said. Just stay on the line with me. It's going to be okay. No, she whispered, barely audible over the screaming in the background. It isn't. A few minutes later, I was in the break room, getting a coffee and trying to stop my hands from shaking. I was hyperventilating, full of an incomprehensible terror and anxiety that I had never felt on this job before. Before the call had cut out, it sounded like a street full of rabid people had surrounded the caller's house. And then the radio came on from the police unit that had been first to arrive at the scene. Dispatch, you there? This is Shay. I heard the voice of Trooper Shay crackling. I immediately picked up on the backup unit that we kept in the break room. This is dispatch, I said. What's going on? I came down Kansas Street from Union Road, and it's totally empty except for a few bloodstains. Were you able to get the house number of the caller? He asked. Not negative on that, I said. Do you see any broken glass or smashed down doors? It sounded like pure insanity at the end of the call. She claimed she was being attacked by one of her neighbors. Trooper Shea consulted with his partner on the street for a moment before responding. We just heard screaming and glass shattering. It sounded like it came from number 67 on Kansas Street. Send back up. I ran back to the main room. We had a new system that could live stream 911 calls directly to the cars of police in the area, as well as live stream audio from the car back to dispatch. I turned it on, entering the number of Trooper Shea's patrol car and listened intently. Come out with your hands up. I heard Shea's partner yell. Shea gasped. Oh God, she needs medical attention, he said. She's got blood coming out of her eyes, her ears, her nose. 
and she's vomiting. What do you think she has? Ma'am, stop right there. Trooper Shea yelled. Don't come any closer. And then I heard a rash of swearing and yelling followed by a gunshot. I dropped my coffee cup on the floor here and it shattered and spread burning hot liquid across my shoes. But I was so engrossed and horrified by what I was hearing that I had barely noticed. Oh God, she bit me. Shea's partner said. She bit my thumb off. I heard another series of gunshots and then the slamming of car doors. Go, go, go. One of them said, and I heard the squealing of tires. Oh crap, what is that? Shay said, and then his voice came in over the radio. Dispatch, this is Shay, and we have a major obstruction blocking the intersection of Kansas and Maine. It looks like... Okay, I know this is going to sound insane, but it looks like a pile of bodies. Literally hundreds of them, stacked on top of each other like firewood. Maybe they're just mannequins, I don't know, but most of them look like they're bleeding. We need backup immediately and emergency medical services as well. Trooper Ingram lost a finger when we got surrounded by a dozen drugged up or sick lunatics back there. One of them bit me on the calf through my uniform, but I don't think that it will require medical attention. They were biting, scratching, and hissing like snakes. There's something wrong here, I'm telling you. This is dispatch, I said, and backup is on the way. I wanted to tell him to get the heck out of there and drive the other way, but I wasn't a cop. I had no authority to do any such thing. They would likely think it was their primary duty to secure and protect the scene until the other police arrived. My shift was about to end in a few minutes when this insanity began and my replacement walked in just as I hung up the radio. She looked at me, one eyebrow raised. You are not going to believe this, I told her, and I briefed her on everything that was happening. Her mouth opened more and more as I recounted the story, her eyes widening in horror. And by the end, I still hadn't heard from Trooper Shea or his backup. I was having anxiety and just wanted to get out of there. My family lived nearby and if there was some sort of crime spree or pandemic happening, I wanted to be home to protect them. My son was only 7 years old and I knew that he couldn't protect himself in such an apocalyptic calamity as was occurring in our little town. As she sat down in the dispatcher's chair, another 911 call came in and I took the opportunity to get my stuff and head out of there. I had only a 5 minute drive back home. My knuckles were white as I sped down the residential streets at 30 miles over the speed limit. Traffic was sparse and I saw nothing out of place. Until I turned down to my street, that is. My neighbor was an elderly man whose six-year-old granddaughter lived with them. Both of them were standing in the middle of the road, staring up at the sun, their mouths agape. I saw long knives in each of their right hands. I slammed on the brakes a few feet away from them, but they didn't stir. I tried honking my horn, but they just kept staring up at the sky without any awareness. As I looked down from their faces, I realized they were both viciously sawing at their bodies, opening up slice after slice. A waterfall of red began to run down their skin, soaking into the pavement. I barely could keep it down. I backed up, driving on my neighbor's lawn to get around them, putting down the window to yell as I passed by. What the heck are you doing, Mr. James? I screamed at him. Stop it. I wondered whether I should jump out and try to stop them, but with their current mental states, I felt they might be just as liable to stab me as not if I got out. Suddenly, Mr. James' eyes came down, focusing directly on mine, and the knives stopped moving. The little girl grinned at me, waving the soaked knife back and forth sending droplets of crimson spraying on my car and on her dress. It's, she's telling me to cut myself to let the viruses in. Mr. James said and his granddaughter stared straight ahead like a doll. It was as if they felt no pain. I saw the tendons and muscles in their legs, their stomach and chest as they stood there, going deeper and faster, wavering like trees in a hurricane. Mr. James fell to the ground, red continuously pouring out of him at his granddaughter pointed behind me nearly tripping, her head lolling from side to side as her lips started to turn a light blue, 
probably from the blood loss and impending physical collapse. She's here for you too, she said. She wants to play with you. She wants you to open up and let the viruses slide in. They look for the soft and warm spots. They're so cold. Open it up and let them in and you'll never be sad again. Slowly I turned, seeing the corpse of a girl standing there next to a tree in my neighbor's backyard. Her skin was bleached white and her mouth was sewn shut. Ugly black stitches marring her cyanotic purplish lips. Her stringy black hair hung down past her shoulders, framing her face as she stared directly at me. Her eyes were milky white, like cataracts, and I saw countless bugs wriggling throughout her body, eating away at the skin of her arms and legs. Do you feel the wetness of their tongues? The dead ones just want in. Her voice rang out of my head, distorted and demonic and low. Her lips never moved. The corpse girl just continued to stare in my direction. I felt hypnotized sitting there in my car, and then I felt them, cold tongues that drew across my back and chest. The car filled with the smell of sulfur and decay, and then my vision began to turn black, as her voice took over my mind and I fell into a dreamless sleep. Dad? I felt little hands pushing on my chest. I opened one eye groggily, forgetting where I was for a few moments, and then I shot up in my seat, adrenaline coursing through my body as I looked around for the corpse girl. She's gone, Dad. I got rid of her. For now. I looked down at him, amazed. Anthony, I whispered, looking at him. My head throbbed painfully. How did you get rid of that thing? I asked. He shrugged. I can do weird stuff sometimes, like during my birthday party last year. I remembered the birthday party clearly. We had a clown who juggled and cartwheeled and did all sorts of tricks for my son and his friends. My son said that he could juggle too and he wanted to show the clown. He had run into the house and grabbed a few of our knives and started throwing them up in the air. They seemed to slow down as he rose, floating slowly over his head. They fell as if through water, and Anthony grabbed them easily and threw them back up into the air. How was he doing that? The clown had asked me, breaking character. I had no idea and simply stood there speechless. And then I yelled his name and the knives had all clattered to the lawn. She was strong and I felt her mind. It was so cold, like an icicle going into my head, but I kept her back by building a wall. He pointed to the backyard where the corpse of the girl had stood and kept her there, Dad. I realized that he wasn't talking about a physical wall but some sort of mental wall that he made in his mind. I nodded. She was trying to take you. I could feel the words that came out of her head and into yours. I heard everything she was saying and she was showing me things, really bad and really scary things from where she comes from. She told me that in her home, all the roads are paved with bones of kids like myself, and that the girls like her have their mouths sewn shut, so that they never have to rely on using their mouths to speak. They use their brains somehow. The whole place is run by an insane god who lies by this silver stream. She showed me the god and I felt it looking at me. It was like insects were looking at me like insects with huge brains and big, dark, and scary eyes. He shuddered. What kind of god is that, Dad? A god we never want to meet, that's for sure. I said, tossing his hair, trying to get him to smile. The god that we believe in is an internal love and light. Whatever that little girl worships, it isn't god. Anthony's eyes continued to look blankly ahead as he recalled what the eldritch girl had shown him. And then they looked up at me sharply. I don't understand that stuff about viruses that she was saying. What's going on? Are we going to be sick? He asked, looking so helpless and little in his tiny windbreaker and jeans. I don't know what she's talking about, but we need to get out of here right now. 
I'm sure that we'll be fine if we can just get past the borders of the town. At least I think so. And I also think some sort of biological outbreak is causing people to go insane. As if on cue, a car sped past, a fire leaping out of the shattered windows. I smelled burning rubber, hot metal, and roasting meat. A disgusting combination of aromas that the nightmarish scene had left in its wake. The driver hit a tree, flying through the windshield and smashing his body into the trunk at an incredible speed. I saw by the awkward angle of his neck that he was either dead or dying. He looked like a bird who had flown into a window, snapped in the head, allowing weakly at a 45 degree angle on a totally broken spine. I turned to look at him sharply. Where's your mother? In the house, he said. I took the keys out of the ignition, grabbing Anthony's small hand and running towards our home of ten years. I kept looking left and right for the corpse girl, but she hadn't reappeared yet. I wondered if Anthony truly was so powerful that he could scare her away for good. I seriously doubted it. I had a feeling that she was biding her time and probably watching us at this very moment. The thought sent chills down my spine. As I walked into the entranceway, I started yelling her name, trying to get her out of here as soon as possible. Margaret, I screamed. Anthony was next to me screaming. Mom, where are you? I led him to the kitchen first where I grabbed a butcher knife and gave Anthony a smaller but still very sharp one from the drawer. Don't hurt yourself by accident with a kiddo, I said. Only use it as a last resort. He nodded. I wish I had guns here, but we... At that moment, my words were cut off by a wailing and pain-filled shrieking from upstairs. I took Anthony's hand, unwilling to be separated from him for any reason now, and kicked open the master bedroom door. There I saw our priest, Father Lanigan, with a pistol to my wife's head. She was very clearly sick, bleeding from her eyes and nose, a waterfall of mess spilling out of his heaving and gasping mouth. I put my hands up. Father Lanigan, I said loudly and simply, put down the gun, you're sick. He just breathed louder and faster, his gray eyes beginning to film over with milky and blood-smeared cataracts. He reminded me more and more of that girl. Even his stare was similar, an almost reptilian glower that looked down on everything and everyone around. I took a step forward. All of his attention was focused on me. His gun hand shook hard. Look, father, you aren't like this, I said. You can. But I never got to finish my sentence. At that moment, my son, small and brave, ran through the alternate door to the master bedroom his small knife raised above his head like a tiny Amazonian warrior. Let go of my mommy, Anthony said, plunging the knife into Father Lanigan's stomach. The priest howled in pain and I ran forward, grabbing his gun hand just as he was aiming it at my son. I pushed it up with all of my strength and the shout went high, blowing apart a dresser drawer. I took the knife and shoved it directly through his right eye. His other eye widened in surprise the tears coming faster for a moment and then he slumped to the floor. My heart raced and I grabbed the gun out of his hand, making sure that it wasn't pointed at my son or wife in case that he had the strength to pull the trigger one last time. And as it turns out, he did. The last shot went right through the window, the tinkling of glass mixing with the ringing in my ears from the gunshots at such a close distance. And then I had the revolver out of his hand, putting it into my back pocket and sighing. Let's get out of this madhouse of a town, I said to my wife. She only cried and hugged me, putting her face against my shoulder for a few moments. And then we ran outside, grabbing some bottled water and canned foods on the way and throwing them in a plastic bag. I drove out of there as quickly as I could, entering the fields and woods at the edge of town. But just as I was about to cross over into the next town, I found that the road was blocked. Dozens of bodies were stacked on top of one another, crossing the road and the sides of the road. There was no possible way around them. Half of them were only wearing torn rags and some of them still twitched and moaned. They were all crying, vomiting, and it ran down the group. 
I pulled over, putting my head against the steering wheel, and I cried. I tried calling for help, but no phone calls would connect. The internet still worked, so I wrote up what had happened. In case my family and I don't make it out of here, I wanted somebody to know what really happened in my town. Sighing in frustration and despair, grabbing the revolver and handing the butcher knife to my wife, we all got out of the car and started walking. As we walked past, the pile of bodies stacked like cordwood in a pile 20 feet high, the wind seemed to pick up. The horrible smell emanated from the pile, nearly making me throw up. My son Anthony and my wife Margaret both tried to hide their faces in the crook of their elbows, their skin looking pale and all too white. I heard my little boy suppress a small wretch, bending over as the smell grew stronger for a few moments. And then we were walking away and though it was still terrible, the smell started to fade after a few hundred feet. I had driven on this road out of town hundreds of times in my life and yet I realized I didn't recognize my surroundings. Furrowing my brow, I looked around. The pavement in front of us had turned white. I saw tiny bones placed closely together forming the streets. The trees had also changed. They looked like weeping willows, but instead of long strands of leaves hanging down, they had what looked like intestines and long strands of hair blowing softly in the breeze, moving from side to side. As we drew closer, I realized thousands of bugs swarmed in the otherworldly branches. The concerted motion of so many insects gave them a shimmering, vibrating quality. There was a sound like high-pitched crying that came out of the forest. And as I looked closer, I realized these sounds were coming from the trees themselves. Where are we? My wife asked, her eyes wide, her body trembling. My heart beat so fast that I could no longer differentiate the separate beats. They all slammed together in a concerted frenzy as I realized we had walked right out of our world and into the world of the monstrous corpse girl and her insane god that my son had told me about. She told me they call it Golgotha, my son whispered, the place of the skulls. But how did we get here? I asked. And more importantly, how do we get out? Can we just turn around? I looked back down the road and realized the pile of bodies that had marked the entrance to this mad world was now gone. I saw only the white street paved with bones stretching off into the horizon. And this forest of willows with blood and intestines hanging from them lining each side. Nearby, I heard the gurgling of a stream. No, my son said softly. We are in here and I can feel their presence. The dead girl. She's watching us right now. She's trying to get in my... He pointed at his head. We have to go on ahead. I can keep her out though. She won't be able to get inside any of you if you're near me. I know how to fight her. She can try to reach inside of me or me inside of her. My wife grabbed my free hand tightly. I prayed to God that Anthony was right, that I wouldn't end slashing myself open to let unknown viruses in, or be forced to do something to my family by telepathic control, or something else that was hard to imagine, but had become only too real today. I'm scared. She whispered to me too quietly for my son to hear her. I nodded to her grimly, opening the revolver and checking the bullets. I had only four left, and I didn't even know if bullets would harm the things in this place. Then we heard a voice that seemed to boom from the sky. It was deep and shaking the ground. Pieces of intestines fell from the trees around us, and the streets of bone shook some of them falling out of place like pure white potholes. I grabbed my wife, steadying her as she almost toppled over. My son seemed almost unaffected, but his eyes were wide and he was looking straight up. I looked up also, seeing the sky had begun to rapidly turn from blue to black, as if an eclipse were happening. But I could see no sun, no source of light, no moon or stars. Instead, I only saw a face begin to emerge from the darkness. It was a face that seemed to stretch hundreds of miles across, 
Its skeletal cheekbones and bleached white forehead seemed to blend into the blackness of the sky. Its chattering jawbone and massive pointed teeth opened and closed, quickly in an eerie shuffling way that didn't match at all its words. It reminded me of a wind-up toy that I had had as a child, one that just had teeth that would chatter and bounce off of each other as the toy moved forward in a random way. But its eyes were its most disconcerting feature. They were pure silver, but in that silver, there was a rapid shimmering and rotating. Madness emanated from every part of its face, and I felt it looking deep into my mind. It had a presence that was not only insane but insectile, antithetical to life, and worst of all, eternal. Have you brought me a new lamb for the slaughter? It said in a voice like rushing water. Give me the boy. He will have company with the dead ones, the other boys and girls here. They're all dead, but nothing here ever really dies. Give me your child and I'll let you go. And then it stopped speaking, the only movement in the whole sky being its eyes which now revolved to faster, deeper, and lighter shades of silver, appearing and disappearing in a rapidly moving fractal pattern that seemed to zoom forever inwards towards the center. No, I said simply, my heart beating fast but a rising sense of anger, battling it and giving me new strength. I put up my middle finger and aimed it at the sky. The voice laughed louder than ever. I heard trees falling in the forest surrounding us, the stream no longer gurgling but being thrown around like tidal waves on the banks of its shore. Then you will all die, it said, its voice fading as if zooming away from us. And then the face and the blackness were gone, the sky returning to a deep blue. Light seemed to return to the world and the eerie insectile fingers that had grasped and felt around my mind disappeared in an instant. On the horizon above the trees, I realized that I could see thick dark clouds of smoke rising above the tree line. The road seemed to head in that general direction. Motioning with my hand, I turned to my family. It looks like there could be some sort of town or factory over there, I said. If we keep going on this road, it'll probably bring us close. Or we could turn around and walk back in the opposite direction. What do you two think? My question was broken by a sob from the nearby trees. Wearing around, I saw Trooper Shea. His dress uniform torn, cuts and scrapes all over his body. His mouth turned into a perfect O of surprise, his eyes widening as he looked at us. Please, he said, help me. And then he fell over like a rag doll, plummeting into the dry soil and dead grass that surrounded the skeletal road. My wife began to run over to him, but I put a hand on her shoulder, stopping her. He could be infected, I said. She glared at me. So you're just going to let him die? She asked. I shook my head. We approach danger slowly, I said. We only have one revolver with a few shots. One butcher knife and the small knife that we gave Adam, which is basically a paring knife. I laughed, even though it wasn't funny. The sound of laughter in this grim place just felt wrong, and I quickly stopped. Margaret just gave me one more disapproving frown and then pushed my hand away and knelt beside Trooper Shea. She had some medical training, having been a certified nursing assistant in her early 20s, and used it to check him over briefly. She checked his pulse, his breathing, opened one eye and then the other to check the responsiveness of his pupils and make sure that no blood was coming out of either. Turning back to me, she nodded. He doesn't seem sick like the others, she said. He was laying on his back and she flipped him over to check for injuries on that side. As soon as she did, we all saw the cause of his collapse. He was bleeding rather heavily. It looked like somebody had stuck a knife into the back of his left shoulder and then pulled it out again. The blood was clotting, staining his uniform a dirty red color on the back. He had clearly lost a great deal of blood. I don't think they'd have hit an artery, my wife said to me. My son stood behind me, holding my free hand while I kept the revolver ready, scanning the forest and road for any sign of movement. 
At that point, Trooper Shea began to moan, his eyes fluttering open. Do you? He said, licking his lips and clearing his voice. Water. Well, there is a stream nearby, I said getting up. I don't know if it's drinkable, however. For all I know, the streams here could be made of pure mercury. He shook his head. They're water, Shea said, coming back more and more to consciousness as he spoke. I drank some of it when I was running and it tasted fine. He got up slowly and my wife came running over. He put an arm around her looking like he might fall over again but after a few breaths he steadied himself. Something was chasing me. I don't know how I got here. One minute I was in the fields running towards the woods and then suddenly the trees had all changed and the sky went black. One of those nut jobs in the middle of town stabbed me in the back. My partner ended up getting bitten and became so sick within minutes that I knew there was no way of getting him out of there. He went down fighting though. He took out five or six of those people with him before they all jumped on him and began ripping his body apart with their teeth, their fingernails, everything. It was like a savage dog attack. We started walking towards the sound of the gurgling stream nearby. As soon as we reached the shallow bank, Trooper Shea fell to his knees, cupping his palms and drinking as much water as he could handle, and then he splashed it on his face and stood up. All right, let's get out of this place, he said, pulling out his service pistol and putting a fresh magazine in it. We returned to the road and began to walk towards the smoke in the sky. Within minutes, the forest started to clear out and I saw towering buildings on the horizon drawing closer. It was eerie how quiet they were, however. I didn't hear a single car or bus coming from that direction. Soon the forest and the hanging intestines and everything were behind us and we stood in a post-apocalyptic nightmare. Buildings hundreds of stories tall stood all around us, many with their windows smashed out. Bodies hanging from lampposts on both sides of the road. Many had been there for so long that the skin and muscle were thawing off. Rancid gas causing them to bloat, their faces unrecognizable, their clothes bowing out from the pressure of the decomposition. The girl is coming, my son said pointing down the road. We all had our weapons at the ready. It would have seemed absurd in other circumstances, being so afraid of a little girl no more than four feet tall. Her mouth, stitched close, had dark blood dripping down from her lips and her eyes were wide and sparkling almost smiling. Her deathly white skin showed black, rotten veins that wound throughout her body, hidden by the black rags that she wore in many spots. And then I heard her voice in my mind as she came to a stop. The god of Golgotha welcomes you all, she said. I could tell by the widening eyes of the others that they had all heard her voice as well. This is your last chance. A sacrifice is required to move forward. Give us the boy, we'll take good care of him for you. He will never die, nothing here ever really dies. At this, Trooper Shea raised the pistol and fired a shot. It hit her in the center of her chest, knocking her back. The voice stopped instantly. Run, my son said. There's more coming from behind us. Glancing back, I saw that he was right. Dozens of boys and girls were coming out of the abandoned skyscrapers, flooding the bone-white roads, all with their mouths stitched closed. Some wore decaying suits or the rags of dresses, while others looked much fresher, with intact shirts or pants still on their tiny bodies. Seeing that, we all sprinted away. I stayed behind my son, knowing that he would be the slowest of us all. The others rapidly gained on us and I felt tiny hands grabbing at the back of my shirt trying to pull me back. Turning quickly, I fired a bullet into the nearest target, a small one with a suit that looked like it would have been new during World War II. The reaction of the others chasing us was immediate. They all stopped at the shot, their eyes widening as they saw the dark clotted blood and brain matter that sprayed the street behind the child and then they placed their hands on the remains, trying to shove it through the stitches in their mouths. I heard deep slurping sounds as they sucked the red through the black stitching, pulling their lips apart so hard that fresh blood began to pour out of the stitches insertion site as they tried to feast, 
taking in as much as they could. It gave us just the distraction that we needed. While they circled around it, eating in the body like vultures surrounding a piece of roadkill, we got farther and farther away. Trooper Shea running in the lead, my wife behind him, and then my son and me. We took random turns, going down long abandoned alleyways and moving deeper into the center of the city. Soon, we heard nothing at all besides the heavy footfalls of our group. Stop, I said, gasping, bent over next to a dumpster filled with shoes and a tiny alleyway between two skyscrapers. I need to rest. My son clearly did too. He was breathing hard, doubled over. Trooper Shea and Margaret turned to look at us. What, now? Margaret asked. I looked down at my son. Do you have any idea how to get out of here? I asked. Surprisingly, he nodded. I got a glimpse from the girl's mind when she was talking to us, Anthony said. But I think she saw some stuff in mine too. I don't know if it matters or not. I shrugged. Hey, there's nothing we can do about that now. So, how do we get out of here? There's a well in the center of the city. Where they go when they need fresh boys and girls to follow the god here. Or when they need bodies to feed them. So let's go, Trooper Shea said, pushing my son in front of him. Lead the way, kid. We've got your back. Let's get out of this place. Nodding, Anthony started walking on shaky legs. We followed him out of the alleyway to a massive street six lanes wide. It should be down this way, Anthony said, pointing deeper into the tangle of abandoned buildings. I saw a cloud of black smoke where his finger had pointed. And then we heard the voice of that insane god again, but not coming from the sky this time. It was on the street not far away. The ground started to shake, turning to look in the opposite direction that my son had pointed. I saw a behemoth dozens of feet tall. It had the same skeletal face, the same chattering jawbone and sharpened teeth. But it now stood on a slender body with marks marring nearly every inch of its skin. Thank you for delivering the lamb to me personally. It said in that voice so much like a waterfall, each syllable pounding into the other and causing small earthquakes as it spoke. There was no way that we could outrun it. Through its legs and arms were emaciated sticks with bones showing through its countless injuries. It was fast and very tall. My wife looked back at me one last time. Get him out of here, she whispered to me, pointed at Anthony. No matter what it takes. And then she ran directly at the insane god. Its head swiveled rapidly, its silver eyes following her progress with a kind of lunatic intensity. Its long arms are reaching out to grab her, but she ducked into a nearby alleyway. The thing followed her, howling. Run, you idiots, Trooper Shea said. I wanted to go help her, but I knew that he was right. She had likely given her life to save our son, and to do anything else but get us out would be a waste of her sacrifice. With tears pouring down my cheeks, I pushed my son ahead. Go, Anthony, I screamed. Looking back at me bewildered, he looked like he would just stand there forever. But what about mommy? He cried. Just go. And then we all started to run. The black cloud of smoke was growing rapidly nearer when I heard the shrieks of a woman. I knew that it was Margaret. It sounded like she was being burned alive. A kind of pain and horror that I had never heard in any voice before. Even as a 911 dispatcher. I could see the well that Anthony was talking about now only a few hundred feet away. Black clouds of smoke emanated from it, blocking out the sky above it. It seemed as if it had some internal fire burning within it. And then the children began to crawl and run out from every street and alleyway surrounding the well, forming a rough circle around it. They all stopped and stared at us with their lifeless eyes. I have an idea, Trooper Shea said looking at me with shell-shocked eyes. But you're not going to like it. And then he ran forward and nearly emptying his magazine with a rapid succession of shots, aiming at the monstrous bodies that surrounded him. With the first nine shots, he blew some of them apart, leaving huge exit wounds in their chest and heads as he fired rapidly. And then they closed all around him, and I knew that he was out of time and nearly out of ammo. 
Glancing back at me one last time, his eyes watery and terrified, he used the last of his ammo on himself and pulled the trigger. I saw it in slow motion. No, I screamed, but it was too late. The shot rang out and the corpse children swarmed all over his body, dipping their small white hands into him, trying to shove as much of it as they could into their stitched mouths. Without a moment of hesitation, I lifted Anthony and ran forward, jumping into the well, the clouds of black smoke enveloping us as we fell. I woke up at the border of the town, surrounded by people in hazmat suits. I saw countless agents in unmarked black SUVs blocking off the border of the town. One man in a hazmat suit came over, shining a light in my eyes. I saw another doing the same to Anthony next to me and then I fell back into unconsciousness. I awoke later in a medical facility surrounded by a few agents in black suits. They wouldn't tell me which agency they came from, but told me my entire town had an outbreak of a mutated form of rabies. I shook my head. There was a girl with her mouth stitched closed. I sat and they laughed. A few of the other survivors said the same thing, likely mass hysteria. Maybe a group hallucination from the stress of seeing such a horrifying outbreak. We have the entire town quarantined, however. So far, we've been able to keep this out of the media, and the goal is to continue to do that. We don't need you to go around talking about monsters. I stopped listening after that, knowing that they would never believe me. They never mentioned how many of the bodies were never found, including those of my wife and Tripper Shea both of whom had sacrificed themselves to save us. Nor how a mutated form of rabies could stack hundreds of bodies into piles like cordwood, blocking off many of the roads into or out of town. Since then, Anthony and I have moved far away from that town, the one that took my wife and all of my friends. I thought that I had left the terror behind and started to heal. But then last night as I fell asleep, I had a dream of an insane god with chattering teeth and silver eyes, telling me that he would see me again soon. When I awoke, my floor was covered in footprints that left behind dark, clotted blood leading towards my bed. If you think you know scary, just wait until you forget a Mother's Day present. They say, heck hath no fury like a woman scorned, so be warned. You've got less than two weeks to find the perfect gift for mom. Want to spoil her this year? You can give her the gift of a really good night's sleep. At Creepscast, we're big fans of Ghostbed. Their team has spent more than two decades designing ultra-cooling mattresses that are built to last. You can head to ghostbed.com and take their online quiz to find the perfect mattress or talk with a sleep expert who is standing by to help you find the exact bed you're looking for. Orders ship free and fast, and you'll also get a 101 night sleep trial to make sure your mattress is the right fit for you. For a limited time, our listeners can get an exclusive offer. Take 40% off of all Ghostbed mattresses, plus get two luxury pillows. Use promo code MrCreeps at ghostbed.com creepscast to take advantage of the offer. That's www.ghostbed.com slash creepscast with promo code Mr. Creeps. I'm not a bad man. Here I sit, alone in the dark, in the snow, freezing to death. Well, I guess I'm not technically alone. There's a body beside me. He hasn't been any real company for a while, especially since he isn't giving off heat anymore. I really wish I would have known what was coming this morning when I woke up. I would have called in sick and spent my day snuggled under a blanket watching TV. Unfortunately, that wouldn't have worked either. There's no way my wife would have let me enjoy taking a day off. Isn't it amazing how somebody who sits around and does nothing but complain all day can magically find tons of things that I need to do? Any time that I take a day off all at the same time. Complaining that I'm not working hard enough or bringing home enough money. I need to take a cleansing breath just thinking about it. 
that's why I went to work today, oblivious of what was to come. When I started out in Pennsylvania with an empty truck and drove south to pick up my load of parts from the warehouse, I had no idea what was coming. The weather forecast said partly cloudy with a chance of some snow. That was the understatement of the year. I should have been a weatherman, or you don't have to be good at your job. And in fact, people expect you to suck at your job. Just stand in front of the green screen and look pretty. But anyway, I started to see some flurries about a half hour into my trip that normally took two hours. But today, it would be anything but normal. I got to the interstate and headed south. Before I made it to the Maryland state line, the snow was sticking to the road. It was falling harder by the minute. I slowed down when visibility became near whiteout conditions. But the idiots around me were in too much of a hurry and were having none of that slowing down stuff. It wasn't long until there was a layer of slush on the road. But did the idiots slow down? Of course not. I was doing 45 by this point and the cars were flying around me. I came to a slight turn and it happened. One of the idiots passing me lost control. His car spun in the middle of the highway going much faster than me. The slippery conditions worked in his favor because he slid off the road and into the center section of grass. Of course by that point you couldn't see any grass. The snow was about 6 inches deep. The only thing keeping it from getting that deep on the road was us drivers that were too stupid to pull over. I had yet to see a snowplow. It's funny because there's been other times when a big snowfall was predicted and the plows would be out hours ahead of time putting down some liquid concoction that was supposed to melt the snow. I didn't think that stuff worked but that's just my opinion. After the first car spun out, I slowed down even more. Driving a box truck doesn't do great for traction, but I had one of the bigger older trucks that weighed a lot. It was one of the few times that I was happy to be stuck with this jalopy of a truck. As I slowed down, the second car flew around me and spun into the grass, and then a third and then a fourth. At this point, I was wondering when these idiots would run out of luck and slide in front of another vehicle hopefully not mine, and cause a crash that would pile us all up because nobody could stop quickly at this point. Fortunately, I think the other drivers started getting the point and they slowed down. It was just in time too because we were approaching a big hill. Any other time, like when the road wasn't covered in the slippery white stuff, the hill was enough to make me and every other truck driver downshift and try to get a running start at it with everybody already slowing down to try and stay in the road. We didn't have a chance. The bigger trucks in front of me tried to get a little speed up to make it to the top, but halfway up, the cars in front of them had to stop because of traffic. At that point, we were all done. Once the first truck had stopped, there was no way it was going any further. At least it wasn't moving forward. A few brave or stupid souls tried to get their truck further up the hill. I put my truck in park and watched. It was like rooting for a sports team. The truck would start spinning tires, but it would be moving forward inch at a time. I held my breath as I watched, thinking the truck would get going and be able to make it to the top of the hill. It would inch forward, tires spinning, and then it would lose all traction and slide back. Over and over this played out. The truck would inch forward, wheel spinning, make it a few feet and then slide back further than where it had started. One time, the truck slid so much that it was headed for the car behind it. That car quickly threw it into reverse to make room before. It was crushed by the out-of-control metal monster sliding toward it. So as that car slammed into reverse in a desperate attempt to not become a pancake, the car behind him threw it into reverse to avoid getting hit. As this group of cars headed toward me, I knew that there was nothing I could do. I held onto the wheel and I braced for impact. Fortunately, the truck regained control and was able to stop. He didn't make any more attempts to get up the hill after that. Once everything had stopped, 
except for the snow. Several of the truck drivers got out and met up in the middle of the road, surrounded by the parking lot of cars that used to be a highway. We stood around and drank coffee from our thermoses as the other drivers hunkered down in their cars. We chit-chatted about where we were from and where we were going, along with the obvious topic of discussion, useless weathermen. I ended up exchanging email addresses with a nice driver from Michigan who also happened to be a writer. When the conversation came to a lull, I looked around at the scenery. The snow had reached nearly a foot, making the countryside quite beautiful. We seemed to be in a large area of trees with no houses at all. I mentioned this to one of the other drivers whose name was Luke, and he said that this was a large forest that the highway had cut through. He said there was a legend of a creature that lived in this forest that would appear from time to time and take vengeance for the destruction of his home. Where was its home? I said. Right here, Luke said. When they built the highway, they destroyed several caves that were on the mountainside. They blew it up to make the path for the road. Really, I said. Yeah, I drive locally and I remember when they were building this highway, there were several workers who went missing. Did they ever find them? Well, after a long search, they found pieces of them. Are you serious? I said. Yeah, dead serious, unfortunately. It was quite a scandal. There was a group who tried to get construction shut down, but there was already too much in motion to stop. I looked around at the massive cut that had been made into the mountain so the road could go through. Progress, I said. You can't stop it. I looked at the cars and trucks surrounding me that all sat unmoving, covered in snow. Well, sometimes you can stop it, I said, waving my arms around. He nodded. Mother Nature can do whatever she wants. I looked back at the long line of vehicles that extended as far as the eye could see. And there's not much that we can do about it. I saw the flashing yellow lights of the snow plow off in the distance and felt hope rising in me. But it fell right away when I saw the plow was stuck too. People couldn't move over enough to let the plow through. Looks like we might be here for a while. I said. He followed my eyes until he caught sight of the struggling plow. Yeah, you may be right, Luke said, shaking snow off of his coat. I'm going to go back to my truck to warm up. I'll talk to you later. Unfortunately, I'll be here. I said, shaking snow off and heading back to my truck. I hopped inside and started up to get the heater going. The man in front of me turned and looked like I was about to run him over but I reassured him by rubbing my hands together in front of the heater vent. I looked in my lunchbox and found a sandwich, some chips, a bag of almonds, and a few mini candy bars. Not knowing how long that I would be stuck here, I decided to ration my food. I nibbled on a few almonds and I drank a little water. I knew that was one resource that would be unlimited. Filling my water bottle with snow and melting it would keep me hydrated. It was nearly 11 in the morning, on a standard day, one where tons of slippery white goo didn't fall from the sky. I would have almost been to the warehouse. I'd better call the boss and let him know what's going on, I thought, pulling out my cell phone. He answered on the third ring. Hello. Hey boss, I figured I'd call and let you know that I won't be bringing in the load of parts anytime soon. Why not? It's the strangest thing. This white stuff started falling from the sky and when it landed in the road, it made things all slippery. All right. Well, I'm sure it's no one back at the base. Why would you even have to ask me that question? How far did you make it? I'm around 40 miles from the warehouse. You didn't even make it there. Well, I probably could have gone faster, but I decided that I like life. Okay, I got it. But if you're encouraging me to drive the company vehicle at unsafe speeds for conditions... I said I got it. There's no need to rub it in. When do you think you'll be getting back? At this point, there's a foot of snow on the road and the plows can't even get through. I have no idea what they're going to do. 
What are you going to do? Well, I figured I would call a cab and leave the truck here while I go home. What? I'm going to sit here and try to keep warm while I wait for them to plow us out. What do you think I'm going to do? I think you're going to keep giving me a hard time. Well, are you going home tonight? I'm already home, he said. As soon as the storm hit, I canceled all the runs and sent everybody home. Well, thanks for including me. I needed you to get the parts for tomorrow's run. And that worked out so well, I said sarcastically. You know what, I think I'm going to go. And be safe, he said. And let me know when you get going. I hung up. I didn't need the heater for a while because I was still steaming from the conversation with my boss. He didn't even think to call me, I thought, because he knew that I would turn around instead of risking my life going and getting his precious parts. The thought lingered for a while as I leaned my head against the headrest and took a little nap. When I woke, the chill in the air made me start the truck to get warm again. I looked out over the endless throng of cars and trucks that were covered in snow with exhaust rising from their tailpipes. I looked at my watch. It was 4.37 in the afternoon. The sun would be going down soon, and the temperature would drop. At least the snow would let up. It was only basically flurry now. While the truck was on, I plugged in my cell phone to charge. I didn't want to be without it in case I needed it. I closed my eyes again, not intending to fall asleep. When I opened them, it was dark. I sat up straight and panicked for a moment thinking that I had fallen asleep at the wheel. In reality, I had, but the truck wasn't moving so it wasn't as bad if I had been driving. I noticed taillights here and there where people were leaving them on or if they were automatic. It lit up the mountain like a Christmas tree. It would have been quite beautiful if we weren't trapped in this prison of snow. I finished with my reverie and stretched in my seat. I was about to get out to go to the bathroom when I looked at the time. It was 9.40 at night. I looked at my phone and noticed that I had several voicemails. I didn't remember turning off the ringer, but I must have. I turned it back on and then typed in the password and listened to the first one. Daddy, where are you? Came Carolyn's voice. Please come home. Please call me. The next five messages were the same thing, each one growing in desperation. I sighed and called home. It didn't even ring once until Caroline answered. Daddy, where are you? Why aren't you home? When are you coming home? Well, there, pumpkin, I said. I'm okay, just stuck in traffic. Well, how long will you be stuck? I don't know, there's a lot of other people stuck in the same traffic as me. Why? Because of the snow. But it's not snowing here. Well, it's not snowing here either. Well, then how can you be stuck? I'll explain when I get home, I said. Is Mommy around? Yes. Well, what is she doing? She's drinking stuff I'm not allowed to drink. Great. Now let me talk to her. I love you, Pumpkin. I love you too. Here's Mommy. What do you want? She slurred. You to stop drinking would be nice. Hey, don't judge me. Where the heck are you anyway? Why do you care? You've got your good friend, Jack, to keep you company. Don't get lost. If you made more money, I wouldn't have to stay at home and drink. Or you could get off your lazy butt and go get a job. And that would help out a lot. She hung up. I banged my head against the headrest. Once I stopped thinking about the wreck my life had become, I realized that I hadn't gone to the bathroom since this morning. I felt the urge come on quickly. I grabbed my phone and headed out into the white wilderness. The door was on its way shut when I whipped around and grabbed it. I reached in and took the keys out of the ignition and then locked the door. I made it two steps before I remembered I unlocked and got back in the truck, reaching over to the glove compartment and grabbing a handful of napkins. I relocked the door and headed out. The taillights were few and far between now, but they still gave this horrible situation a festive glow. I turned on the flashlight on my phone and started toward the side of the road. 
and the snow was up to my knees and I had to trudge through to make a path to the closest trees. Once there, I squatted and let nature take its course. I tried to use as few napkins as possible to wipe, not knowing how many more times I would have to do this before we were rescued. As I followed my trail back toward the truck, I noticed a car a few spaces in front of my truck with its door hanging open. At first, I mentally shrugged, thinking that they had left the door open to find their way back to their car. But then I saw that the car was still running. I decided to investigate. I approached the car and saw that it was empty. There were tracks, leaving the car and heading into the woods. They weren't the same as I had made during my trek to the woods. The snow was much more disturbed. It almost looked like somebody had crawled through the snow. Why would they do that, I thought. As I looked more closely at the path, I saw spots of red. I shone my light on them and they reminded me of blood. I turned my light towards the woods and saw a clear path into the tree line. And then a horrible thought hit me. They weren't crawling. They were being dragged. I trudged over to Luke's truck and banged on his door. After a minute, I saw his head appear in the window. Oh, what the? He said, wiping the sleep from his eyes. I need your help, I said. Something about the way that I said it seemed to squash any objections that he may have had. Eh, give me a minute, he said and disappeared into his truck. He soon reappeared and climbed down out of it. Okay, you got me up. What's so important? Are the plows working their way up to us? I looked back, realizing that I hadn't even thought about the plows and being rescued. I glanced back and saw the yellow flashing lights, but they were still miles away and moving at a snail's pace. No, I got up to take a bathroom break and when I came back, I discovered something. I led him over to the car with the open door. I found it like this, I said. So, someone got up to take a piss. What's the big deal? I leaned down and shined my light on the red spots. He leaned down and examined them. Interesting, but not conclusive, he said. Well, look at the path. What does that look like to you? It looks like somebody went into the trees. But look at my path walking into the trees. I said, shining my light towards the path. He turned on the light from his own phone and pointed it at the pass one at a time. There is a difference. What's your point? He said. I think somebody was dragged into the woods. But why? He said, shooting me a curious look. I don't know. He looked from me to the pass, to the woods, and back again. What are you thinking? He said. I shrugged. Maybe somebody needs help. And who do you think is going to help them? Luke said, eyeing me dubiously. I looked at him and smiled. Oh no, he said. You're not dragging me into the forest in the middle of the night in knee-deep snow. But what if somebody's really hurt? What if they've been attacked? All the more reason not to go. You're kidding me, right? Look, man, I don't know you, he said. I only met you today. How do I know you didn't drag somebody off as an excuse to get me out of the woods alone and do terrible things? Why would I do that? I have no idea. You're the psycho killer. How would I know how your twisted mind works? Come on. I said, giving him my most innocent look. Do you hear the things that you're saying? He looked from me to the trail to the car and then back to the plows. All right, give me a sec, I'll go. But if you try anything, I'll kill you and leave you to die in the snow. I chuckled. You'll kill me and then leave me to die. Shut up, he said with a smile. You know what I mean. No, not really. Okay, if we're doing this, I need to go back to my truck first. Why? You'll see. He disappeared and returned a few minutes later, wearing a day glow vest and carrying a large flashlight, along with a baseball bat that had been sawed off partway up, making it around a foot shorter than a regular bat. What's that? I said. My deterrent. Deterrent against what? He shrugged. Theft, attack, property damage, you name it. I looked at my phone and realized that I had no deterrent. The thought suddenly struck me. 
I'm going into the woods alone with this person that I've just met, and he has a weapon. I have no idea if he dragged somebody off into the woods and killed them. Maybe we should get somebody else to go along with us, I said. He looked around. Like who? He said. You want to go around and wake everybody up, form a posse, and storm the woods for somebody who might have just had a nosebleed as they were heading out to take a dump. Well, when you put it like that, I said, feeling stupid. Let's go, he said, pointing his flashlight towards the trail. We trudged through the snow following the trail. I strode through the untouched, knee-deep snow beside the path, so as not to disturb what might be evidence. I turned around and saw that he was walking right through the middle of the path. I stopped and stared at him. What are you doing? I said. What? It's easier this way, he said. A lot better than trudging through that deep stuff. I sighed and hung my head, and then I stepped into the path just like him. After a short time, I thought to myself, This is much easier, but I'm not telling him that. The wind picked up and started throwing snow around, making my protest moot and sending chills through me. We walked until we got to the tree line, and I paused and waited for him. Why'd you stop? He said. You've got the light. Why don't you go first? And because this is your little investigation, I was asleep in my truck when you dragged me out of here. But you've got the brighter light, I said. He grabbed my phone and replaced it with the big flashlight. Happy now? No, I thought. I stepped into the trees, flashing the light all around. The snow wasn't as deep because of the trees making walking easier. The wind wasn't as strong under the trees either. After doing a quick look around, I refocused on the path. It still seemed like somebody was being dragged in a straight line, avoiding trees. There was a definite destination someone or something had in mind. That hadn't put my mind at ease. In fact, it made me nervous, which made me paranoid. Even though I kept the light into the path, I found my eyes darting to the sides quite often in case something was about to attack. It never crossed my mind until now that we were heading right where it wanted its other victim. Essentially, we were delivering the next two courses of its meal, like we were door dashing ourselves right to it. I paused for a moment and pretended to warm myself by rubbing my arms to hide the fact that I was shaking, and it had nothing to do with the weather. Why don't you lead for a... I turned to say, but he was gone. I shone the flashlight all around but found no sign of him. I backtracked on the path but saw no footprints other than my own. My mind flew in a thousand directions. Where is he? Did whatever drag the other person out here take him to? What do I do? Do I retrace my path back to the truck and sit there like nothing happened? And then I remembered. He has my phone. Panic grabbed me and dragged me down into despair. I spun around seeing nothing but trees and snow. I wasn't sure which way I had come and which way I was going. At that point, all I wanted to do was go back to the truck. I looked at the path and mentally flipped a coin to decide which way to go. Once I started out again, I kept glancing to the sides for anyone trying to sneak up on me. The trees seemed to go on forever. Several times I felt that I had made the wrong choice and decided to turn back. But I had dragged my friend out here and I had to find him. My feet were freezing even though I wore boots and they weren't hunting boots and weren't suited for long tracks in deep snow. Just as I was about to give up, the trees opened into a clearing and I saw the cave. The wind had picked up but the trail was still visible for where somebody had been dragged. The path led right into the mouth of the cave. I froze on the spot. I had found what I was looking for, but now all I felt like doing was turning and running full speed away from it. My survival instinct had a serious discussion with my conscience about the benefits of self-preservation versus honor. In the end, self-preservation pulled out the big gun. Reason. I'm a truck driver, I thought. I'm not a hunter, a cop, or a survivalist. I turned to start back when I heard something. I paused and listened. It was coming from the cave. It was a song. 
As I listened, I realized exactly what it was. It was Metallica's All Nightmare Long, my ringtone. My mind slowly put two and two together. Luke has my phone and I hear my phone in the cave. Therefore, Luke is in the cave. And if he's in the cave, it's probably not in his own free will. I slung back into the cover of trees to work out a plan. Get the heck out of there, was the first plan my mind came up with, followed closely by, get the heck out of here right now and don't look back. I wish that I would have listened to either of those plans. What I eventually settled on was, sneak around to the side of the entrance and try to see what's inside without being seen. That was the plan, however my mind was a little fuzzy in the details of how to accomplish that. I went back into the trees about 10 yards and then followed the tree line for 30 yards or so. After that, I carefully creeped out of the trees, making sure my or Luke's flashlight was off and snuck over to the mouth of the cave. The wind had died down and the sky was clear. There was enough of a moon reflecting off the snow to allow me to see where I was going without the flashlight. I crept up to the edge of the cave opening. My heart was beating out of my chest with every step that I took closer to the cave. I froze when I heard movement inside. I backed away as quickly and quietly as possible, and then tried to become part of the hillside. Mere moments later, something big and white lumbered out of the cave. My mind fought against the reality of what my eyes were seeing. It was big, bigger than a man and covered in long white fur. It walked upright, swinging its massive arms with claws at the end. I stood frozen in terror that the monster might spot me. I didn't breathe until it had disappeared into the trees. I crept into the cave, slowly peeking around the corner in case there was something else horrible in there. But what I found was amazing. There was a roaring fire going in the middle of the cave. I completely forgot where I was and stepped right up to it, holding out my frozen hands. The warmth felt so good that I took off my coat to bask in the heat. My feet screamed to be next. I sat beside the fire and took my boots off, holding my stocking feet up to the flames, nearly crying as they thawed. I closed my eyes and enjoyed being warm for the first time since we had started the search. When I opened my eyes, I looked around the cave and really wished that I hadn't. The resident of the cave had a certain, let's say, decorating style. The walls were splashed with red and in the corner were human heads, each one dangling from their own hair. There were wind chimes made of bones and in the corner was a large patch of pink hanging from a tree branch that had been stuck into the wall of the cave. As mortified as I was, I was drawn to the pink thing hanging in the corner. I approached it slowly and put my hand out. The smell was horrific. It was like a backed up sewage plant on a hot summer day. I gingerly touched the surface of it and recoiled immediately. It was human skin. I saw holes where arms and legs would go in. The monster was making its own human suit. After gawking at the macabre decorations, I remembered why I was here. On my phone. I searched all over, eventually finding it in the pocket of a very recently dead body. Poor Luke, I thought, looking at the dismembered body. I wish I hadn't dragged him along in this stupid investigation. In fact, I wish I wouldn't have dragged me along in this stupid investigation. Should have left it to the police. I looked at my phone with a new revelation. I dialed 911. 911, what's your emergency? A woman's voice answered. I'm in a cave in the forest and there are a lot of bodies here, I said. The monster who killed them could be back at any moment. I need police and emergency services. Sir, prank calls to emergency services are a chargeable offense. It's not a prank call. I need help out here as soon as possible. Even if I believed you, all my units are tied up right now with the weather emergency. In case you haven't noticed, we've had a significant snowfall in the last 24 hours. I know. My truck is stuck at mile marker 145, I said. 
I came out here to the woods to investigate somebody being dragged out of their car. The phone was ripped out of my hand and flung across the cave, where it landed and the screen went dark. I looked up and there stood the creature. Somehow it had snuck back into the cave while I was distracted with my ultimately futile phone call. I heard a low growl as it bared its fangs and flexed its claws. A yellow river ran down my leg as my mind went into pure panic mode. I knew that I was about to die horribly. I backed away slowly as it pursued me, matching me step for step. I backed myself into the corner where the heads hung in their grisly display. As I prepared to die, I had a moment of clarity. I reached up and pulled down one of the heads. The creature stopped and watched as I stared deeply into the eyes of this formerly living being. And then I reached back and threw it at the creature with every ounce of strength that I possessed. The head hit him square in the shoulder and he stumbled back in surprise. I didn't give him the luxury of recovering. I grabbed another head and threw it, and then another and another. Each one hit him in the torso and caused him to retreat another step. Finally, my aim was true and the thrown head connected with his. He seemed dazed for a moment. As I reached for another head and realized that, I had run out of my ammunition. I reached down and pulled two femurs loose from a body. I ran at the creature, swinging my clubs and connecting. At first, I hit a leg and then an arm and finally the head. Once I was close enough to hit his head, that's all that I aimed for. Hearing satisfying cracks of bone on bone drove me into a frenzy. I swung like a madman. The creature tried to swipe at me. It slashed my arm and my chest, but I didn't care. I was in a berserker rage, fighting for my life. I knew that if I stopped or even paused, it would all be over. Blow after blow landed staggering him backward. I never thought of where we were going, just fought like a wild man. The creature stumbled on a rock and fell backwards into the fire. I watched as the scene seemed to unfold in slow motion. His arms pinwheeled as he lost his balance and his back landed on the burning wood. He laid there for a moment, looking like he was unable to move, and then he sucked in a massive gulp of air and unleashed the loudest scream that I had ever heard. Even if I hadn't been fighting for my life, the scream would have chilled me to the bone. He rolled off the fire and half ran, half limped out of the cave. I followed him out, watching as the trail of smoke had disappeared into the distance. I went back inside and stared at the warm, inviting fire that had saved my life. I knew that it would be so easy to sit beside it and stay nice and toasty. I also knew that eventually the creature would return to his cave, and this time he wouldn't be caught off guard. I knew the only way to survive was to try to find my way back to my truck. I put my boots back on and immediately wished that I hadn't. They hadn't been close enough to the fire to really warm up. My feet were freezing from moment one. My jacket was like wearing a blanket of ice as well. I looked over at Luke's headless body, and I was filled with regret for getting him into this mess. I owed it to him to take him away from this place so that that thing wouldn't be able to defile his body anymore. I leaned down and hefted him onto my shoulder. I was glad that he was smaller than me or I wouldn't have made it too far. I started toward the trees, hoping to pick up the path that we had used to get here. Partway through, I did find the path, but it seemed to lead to the left. The last thing that I wanted to do was get lost and give that monster a chance to ambush me. I had been carrying Luke for around a half hour. I was exhausted and the adrenaline crash from fighting off a monster had left me drained. I collapsed into the snow as Luke's body flopped off my shoulders. I didn't have the energy to get up. I was freezing to death. Luke's body was no help. It had already gone cold. So, this was where I sat. And if my story had ended there, it would have been bad. But thankfully, it didn't. I resisted the urge to fall asleep. I sat and looked at the trees, thinking maybe they would give or tell me what to do. But the trees didn't say anything. But as I sat there, I heard something. It was off in the distance, but it was loud. 
I stood, finding myself drawn to the sound. Knowing that I could barely stand, let alone carry Luke, I left his body there. I stumbled forward, guided by the sound. A few minutes later, I stood at the edge of the trees and looked as cars and trucks flew by on the interstate. I nearly cried. I walked to the berm of the road and looked right. There, maybe 50 feet away, sat my truck. Behind it was a state truck with its hazard lights on. I walked up and knocked on the door of the state truck. The driver looked out at me and nearly choked on the sandwich that he was eating. Oh, what the heck happened to you? He said, looking at my blood-soaked clothes. It's a long story, I said. He called for police and an ambulance, and when they got there, I explained the situation repeatedly. When the cop looked like he wanted to arrest me, I explained about calling 911 from the cave. They kept me there in an ambulance, so at least I was warm while the cops searched for Luke's body in the cave. They found both by retracing my steps. Once the police were satisfied, the ambulance took me to the hospital. They checked my wounds and they patched me up, and then admitted me for observation. I used the hospital phone to call home to a panic-stricken Carolyn and a belligerent wife. I told them that I would be home in the morning. Carolyn was ecstatic. My wife was ambivalent. Next, I called the boss and told him where the truck had been towed to. I also told him where he could stick his job and I hung up. I had just settled in to watch his show and fall asleep when my phone rang. Hello? Well, aren't you just the hero? The voice said. My spine turned to ice. Luke? Good guess. But how? You haven't figured it out yet. Maybe I should wait and see if you can put the pieces together. You were behind me and then you disappeared. Good so far. I thought maybe you would turn back until I saw your body in the cave. Nope, he said. Wrong guess. But you were beheaded. Wrong again. So that leaves only. You were the monster, I said softly. Ding, 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 we have a winner, he said. Why? Why, you ask? He said as he snorted. Because people are the animals. Look at us. All we do is run around like rats in a maze trying to get ahead. We'll barely eke in on enough of a living to feed our families. That's not living. And what you do is, I said grinding my teeth, you slaughter people for fun. I'm alive. When I become the creature, I'm free. No. You're captive to your sick desires, I said. He chuckled. Then so are you. What do you mean? You saw how many heads around the walls, over a dozen, and yet not one of them fought with the ferocity, the sheer rage that you did. Face it, you're like me. I'm nothing like you, I said quietly. Oh, I disagree. I think you're more like me than you would like to admit. I think it would only take a little nudge to push you out of the light and into the darkness. I'll never be like you. What if I told you someone you loved was going to die tonight? The phone disconnected. Luke! I screamed into the phone but was only answered with a busy signal. I slammed the phone down and ripped the IV out of my arm. What are you doing? A nurse said as she walked into the room. Leaving. I said, getting out of bed and dressing. Uh, you're bleeding. Well, then give me a band-aid, I said, putting on my shoes. You can't leave, she said, holding my arms, trying to guide me back to bed. I glared death into her eyes. She backed away and left the room. I put on my shirt and jacket, and then I walked out. I was met at the door by a security guard. Sir, I'm going to have to ask you to go back to your room and get back into bed, he said. Why, am I under arrest? Well, no, sir. Then how can you detain me? Uncertainty blossomed in his eyes. I'm leaving, I said. My family is in danger. If you want to call the cops, then send them to my home address, but get out of my way. He hesitated for a moment and then stepped aside. 
I stopped at a courtesy phone and made a quick call and then went outside. The snow from the previous day was piled up at the edges of the parking lot, making them look like miniature mountains. Out of one of the mountains stepped Luke. His face was bruised and he walked with a slight limp as he came towards me. I slipped my hand around to the back of my waistband and he paused. Did you bring a little something for me? He said. You want to find out? He chuckled. Maybe later. So here we are again. What should we talk about this time? How about when you became insane? Toot toot. You shouldn't label people. I'm not, I said. You're not a person. I find the irony in the fact that you were building a human costume. He narrowed his eyes at me. It's not a costume. I just wonder, I said, ignoring him. What happens when it's done? Will you then make another bigger monster costume to wear on top of it? I told you that it isn't a costume. He screamed, taking a step towards me. I readjusted my grip behind me, causing him to stop. That's right, little caveman. I can end you at any time. He blinked and his eyes flicked from utter rage to nonchalance. You know it's illegal to carry a handgun across state lines without a permit, he said. It's only illegal if you get caught. Sirens pierced the night air as red and blue lights flashed. Well, aren't you clever keeping me busy while the police arrive, he said turning. Don't. I said, holding my hand behind my back. He smiled. I'll say hi to your family while you talk to the cops. And then he disappeared. I ran back inside the hospital and called home. Hello? Carolyn said. Honey, you need to put mommy on the phone. Daddy, when are you coming home? Soon, pumpkin, soon, but I need to talk to your mom. Okay, here she is. What? She said, groggily, You need to take Carolyn and go to your mother's house, I said. There was a slight pause. It's 2.30 in the morning, she growled. It is? I don't even know. You want me to go to my mother's house at 2.30 in the frickin' morning? Why? So she can tell me how worthless I am too. Oh, I'll get right on that. No, listen, you're in danger. The phone disconnected. No! I screamed as I slammed the phone down and then picked it up again to call home. Hello? Carolyn, I said. Listen, there's something I need you to do for me. Okay, Daddy. There's a man coming to the house. He's a friend of mine and we're playing a little game. Ooh, what kind of game? Hide and seek. Is he looking for you? No, actually, he's looking for you and Mommy. Why? That's just the way that we play this game. Okay. I need you to go find the best hiding place that you have. The one where nobody will ever find you and you don't come out until I get there. How will I know it's you? I'll whistle your favorite song. Okay. Now, it might be a while until I get there, but I want you to go hide now. What about Mommy? I tried to tell Mommy, but she doesn't want to play. Well, maybe I should ask her. No, Pumpkin, you just hide. I'll take care of Mommy. Okay, Daddy. You should go to the bathroom and get yourself some water and snacks because you might be hiding for a while. Okay, Daddy. That's my awesome girl. I love you very much. I love you too, Daddy. Don't forget, Mommy isn't playing. So if she calls for you or comes looking for you, don't come out until you hear me whistling your favorite song. That'll be easy. Mommy never comes looking for me. I sighed and stifled a tear. Okay, Pumpkin, I better get going so we can play the game. What happens if he finds me before you do? My breath caught in my throat. Then we lose, I said quietly. We want to win, don't we? We most definitely want to win. Okay, I'll see you later. The phone disconnected. I hope so, I thought. Three squad cars pulled up to the front of the hospital, sirens blaring, lights flashing. They ran inside the hospital and locked eyes on me. Freeze, the first cop said, pointed his gun at me. I put my hands up. I'm the one who called you. I said as the cop searched me and found no weapon. What are you talking about? He said, more than a little annoyed. You heard about them finding all the bones and body parts in the cave out by the interstate. 
The cop narrowed his eyes. That hasn't been released to the public yet. He said quietly, looking around for anybody who might be within earshot. Well, I was there. I was in the cave, I said. So why aren't you upstairs in bed, he said. I had heard that you had been injured. Because the murderer called me and said that he was going after my family, thinking that I was laying helpless in a hospital bed. My God. Yeah, that's why I called you, I said. I need to get home before he gets there. Let's go then, he said, starting toward the door. Where's your house? Well, in Pennsylvania. He stopped and turned on me. You realize this is Maryland, right? I know, I was driving a delivery truck when I got stuck in the snowstorm. I can't do anything in another state, he said. Can you at least drive me there? He hesitated. I don't know. My wife and eight-year-old daughter's lives are at stake. He stepped over to the other cops and spoke quietly to them. After a moment, they left and he stepped over to me. I can take you, but I won't be able to intervene in any way, he said. That's fine as long as I get there. Let's go, he said heading for the door. He turned his lights on and drove like a madman for 58 miles. When we were almost there, he slowed down and turned off the lights. We pulled up to the house and I looked at the unusual lights that were on. How's it look, he said. I scanned the house slowly and found nothing amiss. It looks like it should. I said getting out and starting toward the driveway. Do you want me to call local law enforcement? I paused and considered it. I'll wait until I check out the house, I said. Thanks for everything. That's it, he said. This man is dangerous and I don't want you to get hurt too. I appreciate everything you've done, which is why I'm telling you to leave. He sighed and stretched out his hand. Good luck, he said, as I shook it and stepped toward the house. I walked slowly up to the front door, looking for anything out of the ordinary. Finding nothing, I tried the door. It was unlocked. That made the hair stand on the back of my neck. I knew that he was there. I tried to look as nonchalant as possible. I sighed and went upstairs to the bedroom, trying to look like I was just tired. I expected an attack with each step that I took. Every step that I wasn't attacked made me that much more paranoid. Until I made it to the bedroom, I was a basket case. My mind was running a million miles an hour. On the outside, I was doing my best to look like it was a normal day coming home from work. As soon as I made it to the bedroom, I went for the gun in my wife's bedstand drawer the one that she thought I didn't know about. When I opened the drawer, it was gone. I double-checked the false bottom, but there was no gun. I went to my hidden lockbox and got my gun, loaded it, and felt a little better after checking the rest of the house. I stalked slowly from room to room, watching every corner that I turned, leading with my gun, waiting for the inevitable. I opened every closet, checked every window, and then went downstairs and did the same thing. Once the top two floors were cleared, I went to the basement. I opened the door and turned on the light. The stairs were uninviting and every creak of every step that I descended made me flinch. I made it to the bottom without incident except for a near mental breakdown. The unfinished basement had a musty smell that reminded me of death and decay. I searched the main room and then went to the furnace room. There was only a single light hanging from a wire in each of the rooms. When I got to the furnace room, it was small due to the furnace and tanks that inhabited it, but it also casted a myriad of shadows. There were plenty of hiding places in here. Beads of sweat formed on my forehead and knowing that this was the last place in the house to be searched, I knew that he had to be in here waiting for me. My grip on the pistol was so tight that my knuckles had turned white and the sweat made it slippery. I was half afraid that it would slip out of my hand if I fired. I slowly checked each shadow and hiding place, each one making me more anxious for the next. It came down to the last spot. Beside the furnace was a shadowy area. I gripped the gun even more tightly and jumped toward the dark spot, aiming my gun in the middle of the shadow. Nothing happened. No one attacked me. As my eyes adjusted to the darkness, I saw that the space was empty. 
I faced a harsh reality. He's not here, I said to myself, but neither are Cheryl or Carolyn. I turned and started back towards the stairs when the phone rang. I rushed up the stairs, nearly tripping and falling into the hard wooden boards. I made it to the kitchen, breathing hard, and I answered the phone. Hello? The dreadful chuckle told me all I needed to know. Was I there? Luke said. You son of a... Temper, temper. Calm down or you won't get to talk to that certain special someone. Where are they? They? I only have one. Did I miss someone? I mentally cursed myself for being so sloppy, but I tried to recover quickly. I forgot. Carolyn is staying over at a friend's house. Oh, really? He said as I hoped he believed it. Well, I suppose I can go find her later. You leave her alone, I screamed. Oh my, that is a sore spot. I'll definitely have to find her. In the meantime, perhaps you would like to talk to your darling wife. There was a rustling sound and then Cheryl's voice came on. What's happening? Who is this person and why did he take me? Calm down. Everything's going to be okay. Are you nuts? She squealed. I'm being held hostage by some sicko. You don't even know where we are and you're saying it's going to be okay. Yeah, that's what I'm supposed to say to keep you from freaking out and making everything worse. A near miss on that one, she said. How about try and stay calm and don't give him any reason to hurt you? That sounds a little closer to believable. The phone rustled and Luke came back on the line. This is the conversation you have with the person that you may never see alive again. I could probably look up a good marriage counselor for you too. Or you could tell me what you want and quit jerking around. Well, what fun would that be? So I'm just supposed to sit here and wait for you to come get me. I'm sure there would be several officers waiting for me if I returned to your house. Quit stalling, I said. What do you want? I want you to retrieve your daughter from her friend's house. If that's where she is and bring her to me. I think we should all sit down to dinner together. Never happen. Well, then I'll kill your wife now in the most painful and interesting way possible. And then continue to hunt you and your daughter. I gritted my teeth so hard that I was sure he could hear it. Looks like I have no choice. Excellent. Then I will call back in one hour with a location and you will bring yourself and your daughter. The line disconnected before I could say something that I might have regretted. I slammed the phone down and rushed around the house whistling the theme to The Little Mermaid. As I went from floor to floor, my whistling became louder and more frantic. She has to be here, I thought. If he had her, he would have gloated about it. My desperation grew by the moment and I heard a rustling in the attic. I grabbed the rope in the upstairs hallway and pulled down the attic stairs. Slowly I went up and looked around. In the back corner I saw a large chest that was bouncing around on its own. I rushed over and ripped the lid open to find Carolyn. Did we win, Daddy? She said with a smile. Yes, sweetie, we won. I said, squeezing her in a big hug. But now he wants a rematch. What does that mean? It means he didn't like losing and he wants to play again. Oh, good. I've thought of a better place to hide. She scampered toward the steps and was halfway down them when I called out to her. Hey, Carolyn, don't hide just yet. I caught up with her and we descended to the upstairs hallway. He wants us to play in his turf this time, I said. What's turf? It means we have to play somewhere that he wants. Well, okay, where? I ruffled her dark hair and smiled. Wherever it is, I'm sure you'll do great. We went downstairs and headed for the door. You should probably use the bathroom before we go. It might be a long trip. Okay, she said and she skipped away. I watched her go, wishing that I had nearly as much enthusiasm for what was to come. Ten minutes later, we were in the car and I wasn't obeying any speed limit signs. Why are you driving so fast? We need to get there quickly. Is mommy playing this time? I hesitated. Yeah, she is. Oh good, she can have fun with us too, she said smiling. I think mommy might already be having fun, I said with a stone face. That's not fair, she said pouting. Why couldn't she wait for us? I chuckled in spite of myself. Just then, the phone rang. Hello, 
I said. Let me talk to the little girl. Luke said. Why? To make sure that you have her and aren't pulling some track. No. He paused. Cheryl screamed. Would you like to try again? I put the phone on speaker. There, she can hear you now. Hello, Carolyn, he said. Hello, she said cheerfully. Are you coming to visit your mommy and me? Yeah, we're on our way now, she said as I tried to wave her off. I grabbed the phone. Uh, we're losing you, I said. You're cutting. I hung up the phone. Pumpkin, I said barely containing my emotions. You can't tell them things like that. Why not? I thought for a long moment. Because it's against the rules. If he knows where we are, it gives him an unfair advantage. Well, what does that mean? It's like he's cheating because we're helping him. Just then, the phone rang. Hello? I said. We both know your phone didn't lose reception. Put the little girl back on. No. He sighed. And then after a long moment, Cheryl screamed again. How long do I have to keep this up? He said. If you want to talk to her, you'll have to wait. Now tell me where to go. All right, he said. I can wait a little longer. He rattled off an address and I hung up the phone. What happened? And Carolyn said. Oh, nothing, Pumpkin. He just told me where we're going to play. Oh, good. She said, bouncing in her seat. I can't wait. I focused on the road and kept the tears from escaping my eyes as they welled up. Fifteen minutes later, we stopped in front of the familiar house. I don't understand. Why are we here? Come with me, I said, getting out of the car and walking up to the front porch. The door opened before we arrived and out stepped a middle-aged woman. Grandma, Carolyn said, hugging her. Are you playing too? Playing what, dear? She said, looking from Carolyn to me. Listen, Pumpkin, I said, holding her hand. That man that I was talking about, he's a bad man. If he would have found you, he would have hurt you. But you said he has mommy. Is he hurting her? I paused for a long moment as Cheryl's mother shot me a look of concern. I hope not, sweetie. Let me go with you. Let me help you, Carolyn said. You can't, baby, I said gently holding her hands. The best thing you can do is stay here with Grandma and be safe. But what about you? She said. How will I know that you're safe? I... My words were choked out when Carolyn wrapped her arms around my neck in a massive hug and squeezed so tight that I saw stars. You can't go, not without me. Honey, I said, peeling her arms gently off my neck. I have to. What about the police? If I call the police, he'll hurt mommy. What if you go and he hurts you both? I had no answer. I knew that was a very strong possibility. Take care of her, please. I said to Cheryl's mom as I rose and kissed Carolyn on the top of her head. She nodded and pulled Carolyn toward her. No, she said, grabbing me around the waist and squeezing. You can't go. I have to, baby. I said, pulling her arms from around me. No, daddy. I turned and walked toward the car. Please. Carolyn screamed as her grandmother held onto her to keep her from running after me. I got in the car and started down the road as Carolyn got loose from her grandma and ran after me. Daddy! It took every ounce of fortitude that I had to keep going. It was hard to see with the tears streaming down my face. It took me 17 minutes to arrive at the address that Luke had provided. The sky had gone from black to steel gray. The sun would be rising soon, but it held no fascination for me. All I cared about was getting Luke to stop. Did this mean that I had what it took to kill him if necessary? I had already attacked him, but that was in self-defense. Could I really point my gun at him and pull the trigger? That I didn't know yet. My dad always used to say that you think you would react a certain way in a certain situation, but you never knew for sure until you were there. As far as I was concerned, I was here. This was the time to find out what I would do. I pulled up to the address as the sky turned blood red. I didn't take that as a good omen. I looked out at the old dilapidated warehouse that loomed in front of me. 
It was surrounded by trees and making it look like the forest was reclaiming what had been taken when the building was built. I sat there having a mental tug of war. Did I take the gun with me or leave it in the car? Conventional wisdom would say, of course, I take the gun with me, but I knew that he would play any card he could against me. He would use my wife as leverage to disarm me, so instead of giving him my trump card, leave it here and hope that I survive long enough to come back and get it. I knew that he would be suspicious if I didn't have some weapon with me, so I grabbed the tire iron out of the trunk and headed toward the building. I arrived at the rusty door and felt like I needed a tetanus shot from just looking at it, but I sighed and opened it, holding my weapon in a defensive position. I stepped through and tried to close it as quietly as possible, but that wasn't happening. The hinges made a screeching noise that nearly scared me out of my skin. It sounded like an animal screaming in pain. I expected my host to accost me knowing that I was here, but I was only met with silence and the fading echo of the screeching door hinges. The warehouse seemed like an empty shell. There was detritus all over, but a surprising lack of machinery or the usual things you would expect in a warehouse. I started toward the far wall, watching for any movement. Soon my nose caught a whiff of smoke. I searched the air and found a small wisp rising in the general direction that I was heading. My mind fought against me going straight toward it, screaming, It's a trap! But I knew that this was his turf and he would have every path covered. There was no use to sneak around to try to gain the upper hand that was clearly his. I walked straight toward the smoke and eventually found a fire in the middle of the dirt floor. There was a stack of wooden pallets off to the side and a few laying in pieces near the fire. I stepped up and warmed myself with the orange flames as they licked the air hungrily. Well now, this seems familiar. I heard a voice say off to the side. No decoration this time, I said without looking up. I just moved in, Luke said, stepping into the light. You gotta give me some time to go shopping. Where's Cheryl? I said. Oh, you know, she's around. The fact that she's not making a racket doesn't bode well for her physical well-being. She's in working order. What's that supposed to mean? She may have received a slap or three to stop her hysterical screaming. I shrugged. Understandable. Where's Carolyn? Oh, she's waiting in the car. Toot toot, he tissed. That wasn't a part of the game. I looked at him across the fire. The flames lit his eyes with a deadly and mischievous flicker. My daughter is not a chess piece, I said. I told her to call the police if I'm not back out in 30 minutes with Cheryl. Well now, we can't have the cops ruining the fun, he said unfazed. I guess we'll play another day, he said turning to leave. Oh, wait a minute, I said. That's it? I came all the way out here for nothing. You didn't play by the rules. What didn't I do? You told me to bring Carolyn and I brought her. But you didn't bring her to me, he said. This has the feel of a trap, and a predator can smell a trap. You still think you're some kind of animal. Where's your little monster costume? Do you get the burn marks off yet? He stopped turned and stalked toward me with rage flashing in his eyes like flame. I told you before, it's not a... I swung the tire iron and connected with his temple. He went down hard. As before, I didn't hesitate. I slammed the metal into his skull as many times as I could before he rolled away. I chased after him, wanting with every fiber of my being to pound him until he was nothing but goo. The gunshot echoed through the empty warehouse like a thunderclap. I looked down as blood poured from my shoulder. The pain that followed drove me to my knees. I looked at him and he was holding my wife's handgun. I wonder where that went. I said pulling my coat off to get a better look at the hole in my shoulder. The side of his face was red and his right eye had swollen shut. He shakily aimed the gun at me and pulled the trigger. Again, the echo reverberated through the empty building, but this time, there was no pain with the sound. He had missed. I dove to the other side of the fire and laid flat on the ground, trying to make the smallest target possible. 
The downside was is I couldn't see him. I shuffled around the fire a little bit at a time trying to sneak a peek at where he was. Every inch of crawling I paid for with pain. A bullet ricocheted next to my foot and I scrambled the other way. What's wrong? Are you allergic to lead? If it's moving fast enough. I don't understand why you're so resistant to the obvious. And what's that? That you're just like me. I'll never be like you. Luke chuckled, but it came out harsh and raspy, and he choked in the middle of it. Denial only makes it that much better. I can't do the things you do when I don't want to. Tell that to my face. That's survival. No, I can spot a fellow apex predator. All you need to do is let go of that sliver of morality. I crawled painfully to the other side of the fire trying to get a glimpse of him. I saw his foot moving behind the fire. He was circling the same way that I was. We were crawling on the ground, following each other in a slow and painful circle. Remind me, don't apex predators usually not get along? I said trying to distract him. That is true. Look at us trying to kill each other. All I want is to go home and be left alone. I said wincing in pain. You're the one who wanted this to happen. Needed it to happen. But why? Because it's too easy now, Luke said. You showed me that I need to challenge myself. I don't care about a challenge. You win, no challenge. Just leave me alone. You can't win if the enemy won't fight. Am I the enemy now? He paused. You always were, he said breathing harshly. From the time you fought back, you became the enemy. From the time you showed me my weakness, you became the enemy. From the time you became me, you became my enemy. He rose from behind the fire and aimed at me, his grotesque face covered in red, his right eye ruined. He held the gun in his trembling hand. When you became me, he said, I knew that I had to kill you, and not just kill you, but destroy your world. He looked toward the door and his twisted face contorted into a smile. It was the most disturbing thing that I had ever seen. Even with his face half destroyed, he was still thinking of ways to hurt me. I knew right then and there that there was only one way he would ever stop. I felt a surge of adrenaline rush through me. I rose and ran over to him. He turned toward me, bringing the gun to bear on me. That split second was the most important of my life. He fired as I swung my tire iron. The gun went off. I felt pain on the side of my head, but I ignored it. My rage had complete control over me. I hit him in the face, and before he could react, I hit him again and again. He fell to his knees, and I hit him in the back of the head. He went to the ground, and I hit him over and over. I hit his back repeatedly until I heard a satisfying crack. The feel of the heavy metal rod in my hand smashing his bones made me smile. The pain was long forgotten as the sheer adrenaline and rage swept me away. I pictured every one of his victims and the horrible things that he had done to them. And I screamed as each strike became a new level of revenge. I kept at it for what felt like forever. Finally, I ran out of energy. I collapsed to my knees over the pile that had once been a person pretending to be an animal. I dropped the tire iron and stared at my hands, watching in macabre fascination as the red dripped from my fingers. I reached over and pulled the gun from Luke's fingers. I looked around for wherever he had Cheryl. I hadn't heard so much as a whimper from her since I had stepped inside of the warehouse. Knowing that she wasn't one to keep her mouth shut, I knew that she wasn't in good shape if she was even alive. I searched the far section of the warehouse that Luke had come from. In the far corner were some small offices. I searched them one by one, finally, and in the last one I found her. She was strapped in a chair and her head was slumped forward. She wasn't moving. I sighed and put my hand on her head. She flung her head backward. I'll kill you, she screamed. Cheryl, it's me, I said trying to calm her down. Oh, I know it's you. You're the one who brought him into our lives. You're the one to blame for whatever happens. I stepped back. How can you think that? Because it's true. You met this psychopath and now he's after us. You've endangered us. 
No, I came to save. Look at me. I'm tied to a chair. He was going to kill me and do who knows what else before I died, all because of you. You think I wanted this? You think I wanted to have to be out on the road all the time for us to even survive? I don't know. You're not around long enough to ask. So I work like crazy to provide for my family and it's not enough for you. Oh, if you would get a better job, you could provide more. That's all you want is more. It's not your fault that you refuse to get a job. It's all on me. Get me out of this chair. I hung my head. I'm sorry that I brought this on us. I'm sorry that I'm not a better provider. I'm sorry you look at me as a failure. Where's Carolyn? I laughed. This is the first time in years that you've shown any concern for our daughter. My daughter, she said. You lost your parental rights when you brought that psychopath into our lives. You drink like a fish, neglect our daughter, and essentially make her an orphan while you're hungover. And you want to take her away. She's my daughter, and I'll take her just to hurt you. You can't mean that, I said slowly. Oh, but I do. I want to hurt you the way that he hurt me. I want you to face the uncertainty and fear the way that I did. Oh, it's all about you, isn't it? And you're so blind to your own shortcomings that you would use our daughter as a weapon against me. Look at you. Your hands are covered in red. You're a psycho just like him. I'm nothing like him. Oh, tell it to the judge. I'll make sure you never get to see our daughter again. I pulled out the gun, touched it to her forehead, and pulled the trigger. She rocked violently back in the chair and then was still. A wisp of smoke rose from the hole in her head. As I stared at what was left of her, laying on the floor, the thought struck me. This is the first argument that I've ever won with her. The enormity of what I had done hit me like a freight train. I'm a bad man, I thought. I fell to the floor as tears rolled down my bloodstained cheeks. For a long time, I laid there thinking about the last two days of my life and the turn that they had taken. After a while, I rose and left the room. I glanced back at my wife that I had once loved long ago before. I went back out into the main warehouse and walked toward the fire. My mind had me half convinced that Luke's body would be gone, but it wasn't. It laid in the same place with the pool surrounding it. I reached down and shoved the pistol into his hand. I stood and looked at him, wondering what had made him snap and turn into this animal that he had become. The pain in my shoulder and the side of my head brought me back to reality. I reached up and found a graze on the side of my head. It was indeed, but it still hurt. I turned and left the warehouse, wanting nothing more than a shower and my bed. As I stepped outside, I saw a police car sitting beside my car. I walked up and found out it was the cop who had driven me from Maryland. Uh, how did you, I said, know where you were? I followed you, it seemed like the right thing to do. Yeah, it seemed like, I repeated. And judging by your appearance and the fact that you're still standing, I would say that you got him. I nodded. Do I want to know the details? I shook my head. Looks like you need to get cleaned up. Yeah, I said. Are you going to take me to jail and get me a shower? Why would I do that? He said. I looked at him with utter surprise. I told you that I couldn't intervene. I am way out of my jurisdiction. But, and besides, if you ask me, he got what he deserved. Off the record. Off the record, I said. He looked at his watch. Hey, look at that, my shift just ended. I guess I should be heading back. You going to be okay? My shoulder twinged. Yeah, I think I'll go to the hospital. Yeah, it sounds like a smart move. You have a nice day, sir. Thanks. I said offering my hand. For everything. He looked at the blood and then at me. I think you'll understand if I don't shake your hand. Yeah, I said dropping my hand. You drive safe. He nodded and drove away. I stumbled over to my car, feeling weak from blood loss and adrenaline crash and I drove to the hospital and was treated for two gunshot wounds. As standard practice with AGSW, the nurse called the police, and I was soon answering a lot of questions. After they investigated the scene, they had many more questions. They expressed their condolences for the loss of my wife and for my injuries. They were also impressed that I was able to fight off the gunman. 
And once the whole story had been told, there was no question about the condition of Luke's body. The interviewing officer even told me off the record that he would have done the same thing if some psycho had just shot his wife. I nodded in understanding and didn't correct him. The following day, I was surprised when I received a couple of visitors. Daddy, Carolyn said running up and giving me a big hug. I winced in pain as she squeezed my shoulder but smiled at her as she released me. And did you win the game? I did. What about mom? Cheryl's mom looked at me apologetically. We haven't had a discussion yet. I thought maybe that was something you would like to handle. I sighed. There was nothing in this world that I wanted to do more at this moment than avoid this conversation. Mommy lost Pumpkin, I said. Her face fell. So she's... Mommy won't be coming home, I said. But you said you were going to get her. I know, sweetie, but the bad man got her first. Tears streamed down her face as she hugged her grandma. You promised... She said, looking at me as though she could see the blood that covered me yesterday. I know, sweetie, but I did all I could, I said. Maybe it would help to remember all the fun times you and your mom had together, Grandma said. Carolyn thought for a long time. Like when mom and dad and me went to the amusement park last summer. That's a good one, Grandma said. Or when mommy, daddy, and I went to the ocean. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. What about when mommy and I... She paused. Does it have to be with only mommy and me? It can be whatever you want, pumpkin, I said. Okay, because I can't think of once with just mommy and me. I stifled a tear again. You just think of any ones that you want to, I said. We spent the next hour reliving memories of the fun times the family had had together. Carolyn couldn't think of a single one with just her and her mother. The following few months were tough. Carolyn would often wake up in the middle of the night from a nightmare and I would have to lay with her until she went back to sleep. Cheryl's mom had been great. She watched Carolyn when she wasn't at school and I would have a late run. I also went back to driving the truck. I often passed the spot where the cave is. I know it's off in the distance through the trees but in my mind's eye I can see it. I would like to say that it doesn't affect me. I would like to say that I'm not tempted to drag some of these idiot drivers that I deal with off to the cave and make my own decorations. I would like to say that, but sometimes, I'm not a bad man. You would think that after traveling to an entirely different universe and nearly getting destroyed by an alternate version of a cryptid you used to haunt other ghastly abominations with, you would end up securing yourself a vacation. But no, not me. Not in this job. The 8% salary increase was nice, sure, but I still had to keep chugging along just like everyone else. It's just what happens when you work for the agency. Are there worse jobs? Absolutely. But who doesn't have fun complaining every now and then about their profession? So today, I sat in the briefing room with five other agents while our director of operations, Jennifer, went over the objective and details of the up-and-coming mission. One of our transport choppers carrying highly sensitive data went down over a lake, right in these coordinates. The secret coordinates that were given to us directly by the CIA themselves, she announced, pointing to a large monitor behind her that displayed a satellite imagery and analytics. Um, why do we need a fully armed extermination team just to go to a lake and recover some documents and files? With all due respect, that seems like a waste of resources. Came Agent Ashley. Jennifer didn't answer the question. And instead, as she looked over and nodded at me, signaling for me to stand up and present the information that I had been given as mission supervisor. I did as instructed, leaving my weapon on my seat before backing up and facing the room. Dr. Garth, I began referring to our head scientist. And his team as well as members of the reconnaissance squad have confirmed the area is infested with cryptid activity. 
So much so that it is not on any official public maps and civilians are restricted from going within 5 miles of the area. There will be a total of 8 personnel in this operation. Us, the 6 man team of agents, as well as Director Jennifer and Dr. Garth, who will be waiting a quarter of a mile away from the drop off point in order to obtain samples of the lake and surrounding environment for further study. You will also all be given flares in order to signal when you've collected the data as a contingency in case something goes wrong with communications. I then looked over at Jennifer, nodding for her to pick it up from there. Dr. Garth and myself will be in a high-tech armored van that will be trailing behind the transport helicopter. I'll be on the comms and even though this is not our usual setup, we expect you all to be flexible and follow procedure regardless. Any questions? What do we have to do if your van gets compromised or surrounded? Asked Agent Melody. No, oh, it'll be just fine, Jennifer said, flashing her a confident smile before turning to point at the screen once again. Up came a 3D model of what looked to be what Jennifer was referring to. The van is heavily armored, completely resistant to high caliber gunfire and blasts up to the equivalent of a moderate C4 charge. Dr. Garth and I will be well protected. Oh man, if that's the case, why can't we all be in a vehicle like that? Came Jake, one of the more cocky and reckless agents in Site 12. The landscape doesn't allow for us to be driving anywhere close to the crash site itself. It would be both impractical and a waste of budget dollars. Jennifer clapped back. Those things cost a fortune. Regardless, it didn't take much longer to finish up the rest of the meeting. I interacted with Melody and Terrace on the side as we loaded stuff onto the transport chopper. Feeling as if our previous operation had brought us somewhat close together. I mean, if you ask me, Terrence began grunting as he lifted a heavy bag of ammo and slung it into the vehicle. This is going to be a lot better than last time. I gotta agree with you on that one, Melody chimed in, slipping both a knife and a flare into her utility belt. We had to be a bit on the DL when talking about that kind of thing. Jennifer would get mad if we spilled any details of the operation that we were referring to. So I was purposefully vague on things that I let slip regarding it and told Terrence and Melody to follow suit. But of course, there's always someone who has to come sticking their nose where it doesn't belong. What about last time? Came Agent Jake, standing there as he holstered his Desert Eagle. There was a bit of sarcasm in his tone, like he was practically looking for a fight. But being a boss has its perks when dealing with people like this. Now it's really none of your concern. I said attempting to take things lightly at first. What? I can't be let in on a few secrets. Did you forget who we work for? He chuckled, ending it with a stare that I assumed was supposed to come off as a subtle challenge. No. Did you forget who we work for? Do you want to get us terminated or something? I said, a bit of a snarl at the end of my tone. Indeed, I'll admit it was a little bit harsh at the time, but he had been complained about by his fellow agents more than once and for good reason. Jake stood his ground against my initial response but still stepped away and got on the chopper as he quietly laughed to himself. I hadn't supervised him more than a few times but I did know that he wanted to pick the worst hills to die on. But leaving that aside for the time being, it wasn't long before everything was loaded up and all six of us, well seven if you include the pilot, headed off. The ride itself wasn't very long, only about an hour or so. At the very least, we got to see some decent sights and a beautiful wilderness on our way there. Melody attempted to make some conversation with Agent Martha, who had always been competent but rather quiet and meek in her personality. Her confidence shined through her work rather than her social mannerisms. Not that this job exactly pushed big personalities in the usual sense. Ashley and Martha audibly gasped as we reached the lake, which itself was surrounded by a plethora of oak trees, 
a few of which had actually been halfway submerged in the water. The brush and growth around the lake looked thick, far too thick to drive any non-off-road vehicle through. At most, you could probably get away with an ATV going through there. Down below, I could have sworn that I had spotted some sort of large displacement in the water, as if a colossal-sized creature was swimming just beneath the surface. The slug creature Terrence, Melody and I had met when we dimension hopped, came to mind. Perhaps it was our reality's version of him, as absurd as it may sound. Alright, two minutes from the drop-off point, I announced to the rest of the team, sharpening my tone to grab their attention. Make sure your rifles are loaded, belts are full, and visor cameras are on. It's going to be a risky operation, but our duty to do it nonetheless. The pilot guided the chopper over to the rather tight opening in the trees towards the west side of the lake. I looked out and spotted Dr. Garth and Jennifer's van driving up an off-road, not too far away from the outer tree line. It turned, making a right into the forest surrounding the lake. Disappearing underneath the green canopy, it looked to be a bumpy ride. But that particular area was their only option as far as getting their van anywhere near the lake. The evening sun was slowly falling. If things went our way, we wouldn't have to use our night vision goggles. But that was the best case scenario. I honestly always hated the things. Regardless, the chopper hit the ground and we all immediately exited and began grabbing supplies. I ordered Jake to stand off to the side and keep watch around the perimeter of the chopper just to give him something to do while the rest of us got the gear together. Oh, so I'm the guard dog all of a sudden, huh? He vocalized before reluctantly turning to scan the tree line, making a show of it in order to rile me up. There's heavy cryptid activity here. Did you not listen to the briefing? Ashley remarked, causing Jake to childishly mock her. Their little bickering goes no further as I tell them both to cut it out. We were even just about ready to go before a sudden and booming bang erupted from within the trees, causing all of us to raise our weapons and step into a circular formation. It sounded to me as if a large branch had fallen off a tree and smashed into the ground, but a bit more forceful than just that, like it had been slammed rather than simply falling, but there was no visual to match, so I radioed over to Jennifer. This is Agent Ron. Possible chance of hostile encounter. We're keeping our eyes peeled. As expected, stay safe and keep your weapons ready, she replied, with a bit of interference coming through, but not enough to completely distort what she was saying. But I guess that was to be expected in a place like this. We waited around for a few minutes, anticipating that something would emerge from deeper in the forest and come right towards us. But alas, it appeared that it was either nothing, or a creature simply didn't want to show itself. For now. So I ordered the team to start following me to the crashed chopper site and then told the pilot who had dropped us off to fly it for the time being and circle around the lake, which itself was only a few feet off to the left of us. It was an immediate drop off from the ground into the water with next to no slope. The unarmed recon team that had been here previously said that they had used sonar devices in order to try and measure the depth of the water. Now this following piece of information is only known between Jennifer, I, and the higher-ups, but from what the reports have stated, the lake somehow or some way appeared to not actually have a bottom. Now basic logic would dictate that that's impossible, but then again, Look where I work. But regardless of whether or not the lake's depth was truly infinite, I did not want to take the plunge to find out. I had enough with liquid abysses back on the alternate earth. I couldn't even imagine what kind of monstrosities could lurk in an infinite body of water. And even though I was the only one who knew the truth, I could tell the rest of the squad was on edge just from all the noises alone. We had marched less than a hundred meters along the edge before the alarming sound that we had heard earlier emerged again, and this time notably coming from further forward. 
We all rushed forward, me taking the lead as we all climbed over a fallen tree and made our way through some thick brush, laying eyes upon a sight that I'll admit was a bit of a spectacle. There were two creatures just around 50 feet in front of us, one of them being on land just several feet away from the water and the other emerging from the lake itself. I signaled for the team to keep their weapons raised but to hold their fire as it had not noticed us yet. The creature that had part of its mass sticking from the water looked to be what I could only describe as some sort of aquatic reptile humanoid hybrid. It was certainly tall, well over seven feet of its body and was visible above the surface. Its head was long and narrow, possessing a snout like a Komodo dragon. On its back, it had disturbingly sharp scales that stuck out like miniature blades designed to protect itself against attacks from behind. Its two arms were surprisingly human-shaped in nature, save for them being covered in dark green reptilian scales. The creature's hands were outfitted with six webbed fingers that had multiple inch-long nails protruding from the tips. But the beast's face was probably the worst part. It had narrow, vertical slit eyes that glowed a scarlet red color which pierced through the slowly darkening forest as the sun set. The creature in the midst of attacking, though, couldn't have been more different in its anatomy. It was much shorter, probably around the six-foot mark, but its general mass and surface area far surpassed the reptilian beast. This cryptid was almost octopus-like in appearance, standing on three bulky legs with feet supporting them that were thin and rake-like, possessing long and spine-tingling toenails that resembled hog talons. After a healthy dose of growth serum, its rather sickly mucus-colored skin was abundantly covered in short brown hairs, similar to that of a tarantula, from what I assumed was the front half of its body, protruded at ten several feet long tentacle-like appendages that waved and swung wildly as these two horrific titans fought to the death with one another. I couldn't make out any further features like a mouth, eyes, or ears. Just that, a clump of hairy flesh and tentacles. Truly the stuff of every child's Lovecraftian nightmare. The reptilian beast fully lunged out of the water with a reverberating, almost gargling roar, and attempted to pounce on the tentacle creature and slash his limbs like butter, but was quickly grabbed by two of his opponent's appendages and slammed it clean through a nearby tree trunk with explosive force. Jennifer, are you getting this? I said quietly speaking into my radio. Yeah, we see it. Make sure to tell the rest of the team not to engage just yet. We could get some valuable intel on these things. The tree the lizard had been thrown through slowly tilted forward and began to fall, plunging right into the lake and leaving a colossal splash in its wake. All of us watching in utter amazement and shock, as the half that had been severed from the rest of the trunk sank below the surface of the lake, plunging into the depths below. I say we blast those things into high heaven, uttered Jake with a forceful whisper, interrupting my gaze as the reptilian creature recovered and came charging at the octopus like horror. Slicing off a tentacle with his claws and allowing the severed limb to begin spewing a medallion colored blood all over the ground in front of it. No, we wait to let them fight it out. I quickly shot back. So, what happens when there's more or they see us? Man, you know, ever since Jennifer has taken over this place, it's gone soft. Whatever happened to seeing something that isn't right and filling it full of holes? This ain't the way that we used to do things. He went on arguing like a teenager who had just been denied permission to leave the house. I could hear him adjusting his grip on his rifle in order to prepare to fire a shot at the cryptids. I had had enough at that point, turning around and disarming Jake before grabbing him by the collar and yanking him towards me. He quickly went for his knife, only to be stopped before his fingers were even on the handle, when Melody had put the barrel of her rifle against his temple. Try it and your brains are on the ground, 
she whispers to Naralda, moving her finger to the trigger of her weapon. I let go of Jake but silently signaled for everyone else to disable their visor cameras and just temporarily and make sure they hadn't activated their radios. Myself included, so then Jennifer Command wouldn't be able to document what was about to happen. After which, I ordered Melody to keep her gun trained on Jake while I kept his rifle underneath my foot, staring him down while more furious than ever before. I don't know who you think you are or what you think you're doing, but you're going to get us all killed. I said in the loudest voice possible that wouldn't alert the creatures who were still going at it. Disobeying my orders and acting like a reckless moron, and just generally being insufferable. You're being insubordinate to the point of threatening the safety of your team. I'm your mission supervisor and therefore I'm your boss. Like me or not, you're stuck with it. This is a job and not a high school physics class. Do your whining after the operation because none of us want to hear it. You really think she didn't see any of that? I had my visor camera on. Jake scoffed. Then I'll come up with something to cover your behind. That wasn't for me, it was for you. Because trust me when I say that dealing with me is a joyride compared to what Jennifer will do to you. Both Terrence and Melody smiled, amused at how I just publicly reprimanded Jake in front of the others. All in all, it wasn't something that I enjoyed, but he had been acting like a child, a child that was in need of some discipline. Alright, now all of you switch back on your visor cameras and don't want Jennifer getting. I began only to have my sentence cut off midway through as I was violently bashed into a fallen tree nearby. My back impacting it with brutal force as I dropped my own rifle into my lap. Sir, shouted what I heard to be Agent Martha before gunfire quickly rang out. I opened my eyes and caught what looked to be the reptilian creature leaping forward and attempting to slash Jake's throat from where I had just been standing several seconds ago only to be blasted with bullets by both Melody and Martha, killing the beast with relative ease. It appeared to have won its fight against the tentacle monstrosity, and it had converged over to our spot after likely smelling our scents or hearing our voices. I don't actually think we were nearly as quiet as we had intended to be. The giant lizard hit the ground with a lifeless thud, and green blood pouring from all the bullet holes that it now had thanks to Melody and Martha. I got up, not feeling any significant damage or that anything was broken. I'm assuming the beast had shoulder bashed me or something of the sort. Nothing that pierced my gear or skin. I scooped up my rifle and walked back over to the rest of the team. I focused my eyes on the body of the creature, ensuring that its minimal movements were nothing more than post-death twitching. I wasn't sure of the official term for it yet but I didn't even get a chance to talk with the other agents once making it back to them. Look out! Martha shouted as two more of the reptilian creatures suddenly leapt out from the lake. The resulting splash sending water our way as they landed on the ground, while the left one charged and the right one had stayed closer to the water. I quickly backed up before firing my rifle, unleashing a hail of bullets on the left one. But due to missing my first few shots, he was able to get a good slash at Martha with its right claw, sending her flying back several feet, while blood came gushing from her chest. No! Ashley cried as she continued firing her weapon, her and I making a dual effort to fill Martha's attacker full of holes. The creature screeched and roared before quickly falling to the ground limp, blood pouring from all of its wounds while the one on the right lunged at Melody, smacking her weapon from her hand as she fired two shots off into his body. And just as the creature had raised a claw and let out a triumphant roar to presumably tear her throat out, Terran successfully shot it twice in the head, all of us watching in relief as its body collapsed backwards and fell right into the water, sinking like a rock once hitting the surface. I quickly ordered Jake, Ashley, Terrence, and Melody to switch their visor cameras and radios back on, 
and then to watch the surrounding area as I rushed over to Martha, who was appearing to be on death's door. I knelt down as she held her bleeding chest, dark red stains all over her gloves and rifle. Her breathing was slow and pained. What's going on out there? Why did we lose signal with you guys? Came an angry Jennifer through my radio. I held down on the button and responded by keeping my eyes focused on Martha as she spit out a hunk of blood and saliva to her right. Had an encounter. All hostile cryptids are taken care of. Martha's down now, I said, hiding my bits of despair. I never knew her well, sure, but she was a good agent and hadn't done me any wrong. Jennifer didn't respond, so I simply stood up, hesitantly gripping and raising my rifle as Martha began to choke out on her own blood, her suffering only becoming more torturous with each moment that had passed. Do it, she stuttered as red ran down her chin. Make it quick, it hurts. I pointed my barrel at her, and at the very least, I'd be putting her out of her misery. She was on death's doorstep regardless. But Jennifer would have a field day if she called me disobeying procedure. I'm sure that I was already on thin ice with that stun I pulled with, cutting off her communications temporarily. I pulled the trigger. The blast ringing out through the trees as Martha went fully limp and slumped over her. Her short-lived pain finally being ended. I took a second, let out a slow, deep exhale, and then turned my attention back over to the team and pointed a finger at Jake's face. I'll make sure you don't see the feel for years after this, I growled, only for Jennifer to come through my specific radio, still sounding irritated. What happened? What's he doing out there? I've got it covered for now, I responded, testing my luck a bit by using a snappy tone. Luckily, she hadn't decided to call me out on it, instead ordering me to command the team to collect a couple blood samples from the creatures and then go forward and follow me as we continued our way to the helicopter, which at the time was kind of impossible, seeing as we didn't have any sort of equipment to collect samples with. Unless she just wanted me to lick the blood up and then have Dr. Garth extract it from my tongue later on. We didn't really get any time to truly recover or take a mental break from the chaos of what had just taken place. That's not how we do things here in the agency. Instead, we had to move on, continue the mission, and reach the objective. I've seen worse, far worse than this. But it was an event that could have been so easily prevented that it made my blood boil right under my skin. And I'll be honest when I say that I had a part to play. If I had just handled things slightly differently, Martha might still be alive. As I said, we weren't close friends or anything, but her death didn't have to happen. Once we gathered what we needed, we pressed on, walking another 60 or so meters before taking a wide left and clearing through some brush. I had Melody stand guard with Terrence and Ashley, while forcing Jake to help me scout for a better and more precise path forward. As I wanted to keep a close eye on him from this point onward, I had Terrence strap the ammo bag along his back and carry it, seeing as he was the biggest and the strongest of us. Careful, Jennifer said rather suddenly over the radio. The van is picking up some movement about 40 feet in front of you guys. I paused and for once, Jake and I shared a look with each other that wasn't anger or irritation, but mutual confusion, as we hadn't seen anything out of the ordinary. Did you mean in the water? I inquired, trying to look for whatever it was that she was referring to. Garth and I can't actually tell. Something's interfering with their systems back in the van, she replied her voice becoming a bit more distorted with each word that she spoke. Yeah, I think I can hear you starting to break up. Do you have any idea what the source is? I grilled rather frantically, receiving an answer that I couldn't understand. I could tell that she tried her best to speak clearly, but it was useless. 
I couldn't make out a single word as the quality rapidly declined. Jennifer, hello. Can you still get visual through our visor cameras? I went on, making a futile effort to get something comprehensible. I told the others to let me know if they could understand anything she was saying, but it was useless. All of their radios were going bad, just as mine had, so it was going to be a case of us being in the dark, cut off from help that wasn't each other. Alright everyone, stay alert and stay on your toes. We need to find whatever is cutting off our signal and destroy it. You got it? I announced, shifting to face them all. Attempting to uphold some form of morale despite the tension as a result of everything that had transpired thus far. You're a good leader, Ron. We'll get through this just like we've gotten through everything else, Terrence said, offering a head nod as a sign of respect, which I returned. We had still not spotted what Jennifer had been talking about, so instead I turned my attention to the lake itself, and just at the right time too. There was a displacement in the water that had been at least 200 feet in length and several feet wide, making it clear that something massive was swimming just beneath the surface. I saw Jake getting ready to fire his weapon, so I simply turned my head and gave him a you better not glance to stop him. And at the very least, it seemed he learned to listen a bit better this time around. Look, Melody suddenly erupted, pointing a finger forward towards the displacement in the water. Although it was a bit difficult to see at first, I laid eyes upon what looked to be some sort of glowing emerald and green patterns in the shape of jagged lines, similar to that of lightning bolts. I couldn't actually see what the actual source of it was. All I knew was that they belonged to whatever colossal sized bees they were attached to. But just as we were making an effort to get closer, a more detailed look at the thing. It dove down deeper into the water, deep enough to where its glowing lines couldn't be seen any longer. Guess this one isn't looking for a fight, Melody said, practically reading my mind. No, it's not. We need to bait it to the surface, I added. What if we use one of the creature's bodies? Surely the smell of the blood will draw it up. Ashley had interjected. Now that right there is thinking on your feet, I complimented. Going over with the team to grab both a tentacle from the hairy creature and then an arm from the reptilian creature to bring it over. Once we had both, we went right back over to where the creature had originally nearly surfaced. I laid the tentacle down right over the edge of the bank, letting the blood drip and pour into the water. I told Terrence to do the same thing with the severed reptilian arm, allowing the green blood to fall right into the water below. It mixed together with the blood of the tentacle creature, creating a sickly brown color. We then all took several steps back and aimed our rifles at the surface of the water. Now we wait, I declared giving a confident glance to the rest of the team. But it wasn't long before we got exactly what we had wanted. After only mere minutes, I looked down into the lake and saw the glowing green lines beginning to approach the surface at a rapid pace, as if the creature was charging up from deep below, like a great white shark hunting a seal. Eventually, it broke the surface like a missile, blasting a wall of water our way as we opened fire. The actual monstrosity in question was what looked to be a giant sea snake of some sort, only revealing about a dozen or so feet of its actual body length. Its skin was black, almost tar-like in the appearance of its texture. The glowing green lines ran across its back, now made brighter due to them being out of the murky water. It had several eyes that ran across to both the sides and top of its head, all of them a lifeless milky white, giving the creature a ghostly and demonic look. It was something straight out of a Lovecraft novel, but it simply laid there several feet above the water as we fired round after round into it with no result. The bullets were going into its skin and that much was obvious, but no blood or any signs of pain from the cryptid were being shown. Instead, it almost seemed to smile, baring its massive fangs at us like we were about to become its dinner. 
Come on and just die, Ashley screamed, attempting to reload quickly as the rest of us kept on loading on the scene. But suddenly the lines on his back glowed even brighter, and he began to stretch out vertically, becoming both longer and wider than they previously had been, when the serpent had revealed even more of its body. I thought that it had just been him rising further and further above the surface, until it dawned on me what was actually happening. Our gunfire, it was only making him bigger and therefore stronger. I had seen things like this before. The matter of our many bullets was being manipulated and used by the creature to add it to its own mass. Every round we fired into this thing and only made things worse for us. A cease fire, I cried out to the team. Fall back, get out of the way. And nearly everyone did. Melody, Terrence, and Ashley did that is. But Jake, well, he was too stubborn for his own good. And this time, it was going to cost him. The other four of us stopped attempting to pump rounds into this thing and turned to run away. As it looked like it could attack at any moment. But Jake foolishly attempted to stand his ground. Idiot. I growled while gritting my teeth before dropping my rifle and running over to him to try and move him out of the way as the serpent leaned backward and opened its mouth, preparing to lunge down at Jake from an angle. But I, of course, was too slow. The giant snake thrust itself forward and downward before clamping its mouth around Jake. He didn't even have time to scream, being immediately crushed under the immense pressure of this thing's bite. The large serpent then pulled back with Jake's body in its mouth, only his legs visible and sticking out from the creature's jaws. But they, of course, weren't moving. Nothing was, save for the red that came pouring out from the creature's mouth as it shook and violently thrashed with Jake's body still in its mouth. The serpent then slithered backwards, slowly pulling its visible mass back into the water and disappearing into the abyss below with its kill. Jennifer, Jennifer, can you hear me? I yelled. The combined adrenaline and subsequent shock overwhelming me in the moment. There was still nothing. We were cut off, confirming to me that something about that oversized snake was the cause of it. He, he didn't yell or anything came Ashley, a stutter in her speech. Didn't like the guy very much, but he didn't deserve that, Terrence added. I second that. A pretty crappy way to go, Melody vocalized, adding on to Terrence's sentiment. We have to do more than just kill it. We have to destroy it, I declared. We won't be able to establish a connection with Jennifer again until we do so. How do we take out something like that? It can literally absorb bullets. Ashley rebuts, still just a bit frantic. Well, then we have to try a different kind of weapon. Melody interjects, just before shifting her eyes down to her utility belt. At first, it hadn't clicked, but once I had focused further, I understood what she was implying. And it was brilliant. Melody then reached down into her belt and retrieved her flare that she had been given just after the briefing. I went in and pulled out mine as well, Terrence and Ashley following soon after. The evening sky was also beginning to turn into dusk. It wouldn't be long before we would have to slip on our night vision goggles. Terrence and I went back to grab a few more detached limbs from the deceased creatures. This time, simply throwing the parts into the water and letting the blood disperse among the surface. All right now, get ready. I said, ordering the three of them to retrieve their flares and prepare for the creature to emerge. I took out my flare once the rest of the team had them ready, all of us standing in a horizontal formation. As I stood there and waited for the serpent to return, the possibility of it having figured out our little trick by this point dawned on me. Throughout this job, I had encountered some extremely intelligent entities, some of which were smarter than humans and this might have been one of them. It's probably trying to wait us out, thinking might know what we're trying to do. Ashley announced after lowering her flare back into her belt. Anybody got any better ideas? 
but it felt a bit too early to call it a day because things just got too quiet. And when things got too quiet in a place like this, it never meant anything good. But of course, this silence didn't last long, because it wasn't long before I felt patterned rumbling beneath my feet, as if something heavy was hitting the ground in a repeated manner. And Terence was the first to make a significant physical reaction to it. He shifted his stance as if he were about to speak, only to immediately cut himself off and plaster a horrified look in his face as he shifted his attention over to something behind us, something in the trees. We all swung around, laying eyes on the monstrous sight of a near cosmic proportions behind us. Headed straight in our direction was a colossal, supersized version of the hairy tentacle flesh monster that we had encountered when first arriving at the lake. In height alone, this disgusting behemoth reached well over 30 feet, and the width was at least a double that and once again. There were no eyes, no mouth, and no truly defining features. Just a grotesque and hideous mountain of a sloppily laid on fur with nightmarish appendages flailing every which way. It was safe to say that we were stuck between a rock and a hard place. We couldn't retreat into the water and risk ourselves being torn to shreds by the serpent, who was likely waiting. So instead, we had to go slightly off our arbitrarily chosen path and book it out of the area. We wouldn't be able to kill that thing without it killing at least one or two of us in the process, not in this spot. Not to mention the risk of these serpents rising up from the lake and attacking us while our backs were turned. Run. Now. I shouted with more urgency than ever before. All of us turned to the left and began to run. All of us with the exception of Ashley who had been closest to the creature. As she started to flee, one of the tentacles shot out and wrapped itself around her arm, beginning to pull her towards the hunk of flesh but she quickly reached into her utility belt with her free hand, pulling out a large honey knife and then turning to slice the appendage off. She came down on it with unyielding force, letting out a pain to groan as the blade connected, and it sliced right through the tissue of the tentacle, severing it and allowing the mucus-colored blood to spew in every direction. I turned, firing off several shots at the creature in order to hold it back long enough for her, to further herself from it. It didn't appear too phased by shots to the body, however. It seemed damage to the tentacles themselves were what truly caused it pain. This way, I bellowed as I held my rifle and kept on charging forward. The three other agents at my side as we dodged past trees, leapt over bushes and avoided rocks and ditches. The tentacle creature was rather slow, so I wasn't very worried about it actually catching us. What did worry me, however, was looking to my left and once again, seeing that colossal displacement in the water yet again. Those lines on its back glowing brighter than the previous time. I could only hope that it wasn't producing some sort of ionizing radiation. The serpent kept swimming alongside us, easily keeping pace as we ran from the tentacle creature and I thought that we were truly trapped with nowhere to go. Until I hatched an idea. All of you, stop. And believe me, they did. Right before looking at me like I was completely insane. And for this idea, maybe I was, to them anyway. We've seen them go at each other, right? Well, let's make that happen again. You want to have these freaks fight? Ashley asked with a dumbfounded expression. Did you forget we used to have a certain freak of our own? I shot back, more urgency in my tone as the tentacle creature covered more ground towards us. We're running out of time and we need to get that data before it gets destroyed. I then turned towards the lake, squinting my eyes as I saw the bright lines of the serpent's back vanish deeper beneath the surface. I know that it was still focused on us, that it still wanted all of us dead but it wanted to throw us off. I've always thought that cryptids were smarter than they were given credit for. Not that I would ever say something like that in front of Jennifer or my other superiors. The snake's going to circle back and we have to get him up onto the land at the right time. I announced, keeping my eye on the Cthulhu-like monstrosity. And I know just how we're going to do it. 
and grab your flares. They obliged, but I still ordered them to wait for just the right moment to light them. We were out of options and I needed something, something that would work out just this once. So far everything that could go wrong in this operation had, and I was not intending to keep failing anymore. As the four of us all held our flares in place, I put a hand up, letting the team know to wait for my signal. The serpent had surfaced above the water about a dozen yards away from the bank, the top of his head and subsequently eyes poking out of the lake as he doubled back and began swimming toward us in a fashion similar to an alligator. As what I began calling Tiny Cthulhu approached us, I had the team take a few steps back, wanting to make enough space for these two horrific titans to intersect when the time was right. But only mere seconds passed before the serpent was at just a few dozen feet away from the bank and Tiny Cthulhu was nearly in range to begin reaching out with his tentacles. Light them up now! I howled, striking my own flare as the team quickly followed suit. And once they were ablaze, we all launched them full force at Tiny Cthulhu, before immediately turning and booking it to get the heck out of the way. Once we had deemed ourselves at a safe distance, the four of us dove into separate areas where the trees and shrubbery were a bit thicker, allowing us to be somewhat hidden while we turned around and watched to make sure that our plan had worked. The flares had struck Tiny Cthulhu, sending his appendages flailing about as the serpent had turned its attention towards him. The serpent then hissed ferociously and lunges nearly half its body out of the water, right towards a tiny Cthulhu, before biting down on one of his tentacles and violently thrashing his head side to side to tear it off. Tiny Cthulhu responds by wrapping several more of its hairy appendages around the serpent and beginning to drag him right out of the water. But then the serpent forcefully pulls back, tearing off the tentacle that he had just previously clamped down and releasing the severed limb from his jaws onto the ground. As a result, Tiny Cthulhu's blood spills like a can of paint that had just been tipped over, effectively coating a hundred square feet of grass in the disgusting green and brown color. The serpent then drops the limb, all of us watching in anticipation as it rolled along the ground. After which, the giant reptile opened its jaws, hissing and preparing for another attack. But Tiny Cthulhu lunges forward rather quickly which was surprising considering the lack of speed that it had demonstrated thus far. It then launches two of its tentacles outward, both of which went straight into the serpent's mouth, and judging by the beast's reaction and down its throat. The serpent then begins to thrash and throw itself backwards, but Tiny Cthulhu only dug its tentacles deeper, the bulges of which could be seen in the serpent's stomach. Ah, poor snake. Ashley blurts with a half-serious tone. The serpent then clamps its jaws down, attempting to bite and tear off these two limbs. But Tiny Cthulhu didn't back down. Despite what I think was pain and blood gushing from the bite wounds, it did nothing to stop him. Tiny Cthulhu proceeds to shove another tentacle down the serpent's throat. And then two more after which, Tiny Cthulhu then begins to retract them and brutally so. I could practically feel the force at which it pulls back with, as if it planned to tear out every organ in one go. And as if on cue, Tiny Cthulhu does one final quick yank backwards. A wall of the serpent's black, almost tar-like blood comes rushing from its mouth, and its lifeless body begins to fall before colliding with the ground. The subsequent boom nearly throws me and the others off our feet, but we all maintained our balance. I signaled to the other three that it was time for us to skedaddle yet again before Tiny Cthulhu turned his attention back on us. In all fairness, we shouldn't have even stayed as long as we did. But the spectacle of two horrific titans fighting to the death had captivated us. Ashley, Melody, and Terrence were careful to stay low and move quick towards me as Tiny Cthulhu finished off the serpent, using the trees and bushes for cover. I turned and could see the crashed chopper was within sight, seemingly so close yet so far. The sounds of flash, tearing and ripping was more than enough to cover any noise that we might have made while running. I turned and took off, the other three not far behind, all of us lightly but rapidly panting as we hustled along. 
The subsequent smell of the blood and the noise from the brutal fight that had occurred attracted more of those lizard creatures, an abundance of them emerging from the lake and rushing over to the scene. Just as I had visually finished counting six of them, several more emerged from the water, all of which headed straight for Tiny Cthulhu. That poor guy, I actually kind of rooted for him in the end, but it seemed like his victory would be short-lived. After closing the distance, we were just in mere meters of the crashed helicopter, although having to climb over dead trees and avoid rocks that would have had us on the ground with a broken bone or two didn't speed up the process. But soon enough, we finally emerged to our objective. The chopper was in obvious disarray. The blades in the top were busted and bent up, and the exterior of the front had been impaled by a rather large branch while the tail was completely torn off. The dirt below it had been torn up and displaced every which way. Bits of charred wood and grass spread about. It was a crash site for sure. All right, I called out. We get the data and we go, and no dilly-dallying. Ashley and Terrence, I want you two watching our surroundings while Melody and I go in to extract everything. They obliged, both taking positions on either side of the debris and keeping their rifles trained into the thick tree line, while Melody and I approached the scene closer. Just below the right landing skid was a cardboard box labeled classified, sealed up with a layer of shipping tape around the top, but in the crash it looked like it had been compromised. When I got closer, it appeared that there was supposed to have been a cover. Inside the box, a stack of documents. Documents that I'm sure contained mountains of all sorts of uberly classified and sensitive information. Information that was far above my pay grade to no one comprehend the details of. I quickly scanned the area surrounding us in order to see if I could spot the cover, but I had no such luck. Even in the chaos of everything that had occurred just minutes ago, I forgot to test and see if our communications had been restored. I tried to radio Jennifer only to get no response. Melody, who had picked up a box that was identical to mine, also attempted to see if things had come back online since the serpent had been killed. But she also heard nothing back from Jennifer, so we had no choice but to head back the way that we came, start a small fire and signal to the team that we needed out of here. The transport chopper wouldn't be able to land here. The closest possible landing location was where we had originally been dropped off at. I wasn't worried whether or not they would actually get us. This data was far too valuable according to Jennifer, and while she could be pretty ruthless, she wasn't a sociopath to the degree that our previous director was. We gotta head back to the drop-off point, I said, causing Terrence to turn his head to look at me like I was insane. I mean no disrespect, but that's a terrible idea. We don't have a choice. The chopper can't land here. How much more ammo do you have left in your bag? I inquired, because we're going to need it. Enough for us to definitely get through them. He said, pointing towards the bushes behind which the reptile creatures were gruesomely feasting on what was now the body of Tiny Cthulhu. All of them overwhelming the creature with sheer numbers alone. I'm sure the wounds from this battle with the serpent did him no favors either. Well then, I huffed, nodding my head at both Terrence and Ashley. Both of you start loading up on what you can. Melody and I will carry the boxes. Terrence, you're going to take the front and kill anything coming towards us. Ashley, the same applies to you, but I want you watching our sex. I want to make sure that Martha didn't die for nothing. Ashley snarls. A sentiment that I can get behind, Terrence replies, gripping his weapon after inserting a new magazine. I held my box, taking a deep breath that I tried and failed to come up with some sort of grand, final motivational speech for the team. Keep close and your ears and eyes open. Also, try not to get eaten. I hope I never have to see this place again, Melody says. We march on, going right back the way that we came. The sounds of the reptiles still snarling and hissing carried through the bushes. We were all sure to stick close together, not leaving any room for us to be grabbed or snatched away from the others. We emerged on the other side, back to where Tiny Cthulhu had killed the serpent, only to find Tiny Cthulhu laying on the ground, covered in his own limbs and blood, 
as lifeless as a rock. With over four dozen of the reptiles ripping and slashing whatever his so-called tissue was. But as soon as one had sniffed the air and caught our scent, he screeched and roared, causing the others to shift their attention our way as well. And Terrence and Ashley alone wouldn't be able to kill them all before they overwhelmed us. I had underestimated how many of them had actually materialized from the lake, far more than when we had originally hightailed it to the crashed helicopter. So Melody and I temporarily dropped our boxes containing the data and drew our weapons as the reptilians charged us, all of us firing in unison. Four of them dropped immediately, blood spewing and spattering the area surrounding like liquid from a punctured water balloon. Don't let any blood get in the documents, Jennifer will have all of our heads. I shout, dragging my weapon to the left as I continued spraying bullets, blasting away several of the reptiles as they ran for me. Their glowing red eyes laser focused on us in the most unsettling way possible. But it wasn't long before I had to dive into Terrence's bag and grab another magazine to reload, putting the pressure on the other three members of my team to keep up the defense as I did so. But I could feel them coming down on us like a ton of bricks and there was a moment, as I had my hand on that magazine, that I thought we wouldn't make it out of this thing alive. Once I started reloading, however, I thought I could somewhat rest easy. But as soon as I had finished putting the new magazine in, Terrence turned and shouted at me with a loud yet desperate projection. Look out! And then all I felt was the hard earth shattering blow to my body. Like getting hit by a minivan going just under 10 miles an hour. I mean, sure, there's worse, but that doesn't make it any better. After the initial blow was nothing but silent darkness where it only felt like seconds. But being unconscious doesn't exactly give you the best comprehension of time. I was thinking that I wouldn't have ever opened my eyes again to tell you the truth. But when I awoke, I awoke to bright, blinding white light. Causing me to hold my arm out in front of my eyes to give them a bit of relief from the sudden burst of brightness. I felt sore and was definitely in pain as I rolled over on what I assumed to be one of our medical wing beds, but I had all my limbs and they all worked, and there was no major or life-threatening wounds from what I could tell, so I had been allowed to carry on. I looked around in the room only to find myself completely alone in the cold, clinical and sterile white emptiness of the medical wing, but it's not like this was a place to go to if you were looking for warmth. I sat up in the bed, groaning a bit as I looked forward and saw the knob to the entrance door beginning to turn, only for it to swing open and reveal four familiar faces on the other side. Melody, Terrence, Dr. Garth, and of course, Director Jennifer, all of which had faces that expressed a different emotion. Terrence looked proud but relieved. Melody had seemed worried. Dr. Garth seemed strangely interested and Jennifer looked rather upset, specifically at me. Where is Ashley? I probed, looking behind the four of them as they entered. She laid down her life, led some of those things away while I carried you back to the drop-off point. Terrence replied, now looking slightly towards the floor. I tried to convince her to stay close and that we would figure something out, but she didn't listen said that she would be more than fine joining Martha if it meant that she didn't have to watch anyone else die. I paused, having no idea what to say at first. I mainly just looked at the floor, trying to choose my next words somewhat carefully. And did you see those things actually kill her? Or is that what she told you to believe? I grilled, pointing to Jennifer with a bit of anger in my delivery. Turns out that I did not, in fact, choose my words carefully. Watch it, she snarled back. You're already on thin ice yourself. We were only able to get one of those boxes of data back here. My superiors are about to have my head on a platter because of it. In my head, I had already cooked up a rebuttal about how next time, if she wanted the mission done better, then she should have given me more agents and weapons to work with. But I was better off not testing my luck. And besides, from what I heard, mission budgets were getting a bit more tight as of late. I'm sure the money spent on that high-tech and basically tank of a van didn't help. 
For now, Ashley is marked as KIA in her file. I don't care if you all want to mourn her and Martha so long as it doesn't get in the way of our operations, she pronounced. And although as cold and corporate as that statement may sound, I could tell she genuinely didn't care as little as she pretended to. But working here, especially in a position of leadership, you have to be cold and calculating whether you actually are or not, although it makes it easier if you are. Nonetheless, with a few more groans here and there, I stood up to thank both Terrence and Melody for saving my life and carrying me to safety, as well as letting them know that I would surely owe them big time for it, and I wasn't sure if a pizza party would cut it. But that wasn't the end of it, because Jennifer pulled me aside and told me to follow her alone and sit down in her office. I was honestly expecting to get demoted, maybe even terminated, but instead, at Jennifer's side, took a seat behind her desk and pulled out a black binder labeled File 34C. I leaned forward a bit despite it slightly hurting my sides to do so, but the last thing that I wanted to do was slouch and risk upsetting her anymore. Why well, are you giving me something new, huh? I inquired. Well, sort of. There's nothing concrete yet, but I'm thinking that if we're able to make some progress with this particular target, the ones upstairs might not come down to me as hard for messing this operation up. It's been one that we've been trying to take down for quite a while now. I'm sure you may recognize them, considering your decent amount of seniority here. She then opens up the binder and retrieves a small folder from within, before looking over at me before placing it on the desk between us and opening it up. After which, she then turns it 180 degrees before sliding it over to me and allowing me to see the contents. What appeared in front of me was a picture, a photograph of what looked to be some dark, dank basement of a building, with all sorts of rusted pipes and dusty shelves on both the walls and ceiling. What's this supposed to be? I inquired, taking my eyes off the photograph for just a moment. Look closer, she replied, a bit of patience returning to her voice as she pointed at where these subjects supposedly was. I looked back down, squinting at the picture and leaning in a little closer. Further down the corridor of where this picture was taken, I made out two different pairs of red glowing dots. And how did I know they were separate pairs? Well, I could make out figures that they were attached to. Human-like figures. Humans that were obviously no longer human. Or perhaps never were, who knows. But all I know to me is that it looked like shadow people. Legitimate shadow people. I'm guessing you won't tell me what happened to the guy who took this, will you? Jennifer ignores the rhetorical question. Instead, she just releases a big sigh before uttering her own question. What do you know about the nocturnals? <laughs>